want to call this meeting of the Belton Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. A quorum of board members is present, and this meeting has been duly called in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. If you will join me in the Pledge to the American flag. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Okay. It is 5.02. And at this time, the board will go into closed session to consult with attorney Ellen Spaulding, uh, pursuant to Texas Government Code uh, Section 551.071, consultation with attorney. We'll be back. Okay, it is 516, and we will reconvene uh, in open session. The next item on the agenda is the Level 3 appeal of the Consolidated Grievance of the Texas Classroom Teachers Association. Uh, Connie, is the recorder on? Thank you. Uh, the date is October 16th, 2017, and the time is 5.17 p.m. A quorum of board members is present, uh, and all members, in fact, are present. Um, at this time, uh, counsel for the Belton ISD Board of Trustees, Ellen Spaulding, is also present, and at this time, I'm going to turn this over to her to preside over this hearing. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Spaulding. You. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a level three appeal, and it's an appeal based on timeliness. Specifically, the Texas Classroom Teachers Association appeals the dismissal of its grievance, which has been determined at lower levels to have been untimely filed. Since board policy requires that all time limits be strictly followed, the timeliness of the consolidated grievance will be the sole focus of our hearing today. The board requests that the parties address only the issue of timeliness, and the board will not consider the merits underlining the timeliness decision in accordance with policy. The board has received copies of the grievance forms and supporting documentation, the administration's responses at levels one and two, and the notice of appeal to level three, and all other documents or correspondence submitted and reviewed in the course of this grievance. It is my understanding that TCTA has also received a copy of the grievance record. Is that correct? All documents were delivered to the board and to TCTA at least three days before the hearing as required by board policy. In order to provide the most accurate record possible, a tape recording of this proceeding is being made. Please avoid talking when others are speaking so that the tape will reflect the proceedings accurately. Also, please identify yourself when you speak so that the record will be clear. I will now ask each board member to introduce himself or herself for the record and state whether he or she can render a fair and impartial decision in this matter. I'll start to my left. Uh, Jeff Norwood. Yes, I can. Oh, sorry. Great. Janet Lee. Yes, I can. Mike Callan. Yes, I can. Randy Pittenger. Yes, I can. Sue Jordan. Yes, I can. Leo Camden. Yes, I can. Ty Taggart. Yes, I can. Thank you, board members. I will now ask the parties to introduce yourselves for the record. Will the TCTA representative state your name for the record, please? Julie Leahy, from the Texas Classroom Thank you. Will the representatives for the Belton Independent School District Administration please state your names for the record? Susan Hinkian, Superintendent. Robert Muller, Superintendent. Thank you. This appeal will be conducted in accordance with the district's policy governing public complaints, policy GF Local. This is a grievance appeal and not a formal evidentiary hearing. The policy does not provide for questioning or cross-examining of witnesses or board members. In order for the board to receive all the information necessary to make an informed decision, this appeal presentation will be conducted as follows. The TCTA and administration will each make presentations to the board. Each side will be given 10 minutes to be used for presentation and rebuttal. Each side may divide its total 10 minutes as it wishes between presentation and rebuttal. Ms. Leahy will address the board first, and then the administration may present its response. Ms. Leahy can then use any time she has reserved of her 10 minutes, and finally, the administration can do the same. Board members may then ask clarifying questions of either, parties, of either party, but the parties may not ask questions directly to one another. Again, the board requests that the parties not discuss the substance or merits of the complaint or the remedies sought, but rather focus on whether the grievance was filed within the required business days from the dates TCTA knew or should have known of the decision or action that gives rise to the grievance in accordance with board policy. Are there any questions from the parties before we begin? 
Hearing none, Ms. Leahy, do you wish to reserve any time? Yes, I'd like to reserve two minutes. Thank you very much. And administration, do you wish to reserve any time? Great. I will serve as the timekeeper tonight, and I will give you a, a one-minute warning on each of your each of your times. Ms. Leahy, you may begin your presentation. I think the board would like you to yeah. present at the podium. <coughs> Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Can you hear me? My name is Julie Leahy. I am an attorney with the Texas Classroom Teachers Association. I'm here on behalf of Rosemary Hans and the Texas Classroom Teachers Association, the Belton CTA. The Belton CTA consists of approximately 200 classroom teachers, librarians, diagnosticians, and other instructional employees that are employed by the Belton ISD. And I am here at their request and on their behest. The first thing I want to tell you is that I'm not here to beat up on you. Um, I'm not here to blame the district for anything that happened. Um, I am here to tell you about the experience that your employees have had um, and to discuss ways that we can move forward from what occurred. I am limiting my argument to timeliness, so therefore I'd like to begin by discussing the time frame here. The data breach occurred on January 27, 2017. Uh, apparently, two employees of the Belton ISD improperly provided 1,700 copies of school district employee W-2 forms to an unknown third party in response to a phishing email scam. The data breach was discovered by the district on Monday, January 30th, and reported to the Belton police, the IRS, and the FBI. The affected employees were notified by email on Tuesday, January 31st, 2013, and the two employees who were directly involved in the release of the data resigned. The district's position is that this grievance should have been filed within 15 business days from the date, apparently, that this breach occurred. The reason that we disagree with this is because the breach is not necessarily what these people are complaining about. What they are complaining about is the remedies that have been provided to the district or the lack thereof. Specifically, the first remedy that they are requesting uh, is more comprehensive or different type of protection for identity theft. Um, we mentioned in our grievance that the, uh, the TASB data breach, which occurred on June 16th, 2017, uh, was a situation in which data was breached yet again. And unfortunately, we all know that since that time, Experian itself has breached personal data. So I think that um, the cat's kind of out of the bag in terms of that personal information being breached. I think that we can all agree that there is problems um, with the idea of offering identity theft as a solution to a data breach of this nature. So what they are requesting is that they be offered a different type of identity theft protection, um, more comprehensive and stronger identity theft protection. A big part of the reason for that, one thing that you all need to remember, and, and I've, I've referenced this, is that many people have had their data stolen. Probably every single person in this room has had some of their data stolen at one point or another. W-2 forms are a different thing. They're a different beast. And the reason they're a different beast is because that creates problems with the IRS which brings us to our second requested remedy. Um, many of the individuals that I represent have been contacted by the IRS. Many were prohibited from filing returns. They were told that they could not file returns until they reported to the IRS office in Waco to fill out an affidavit confirming their identity. This is an issue that is specific to the fact that W-2 forms were released. As we all know, the IRS does not operate on flex hours. So many of these people have had to travel to Waco during school hours or anticipate that they may still have to travel to Waco during school hours in order to attend to business required by the IRS as a result of the data breach that occurred. What we are asking for is that this time be considered personal develop excuse me, professional developmental leave on district business and that employees not be required to use their personal leave in order to attend to this business. As to the issue of timeliness on this, the reality is, is that we don't know yet how many employees are going to be asked to report to the IRS. Some of the affected members had already filed their returns when the breach occurred, um, and some have not yet been contacted. Others have been told that, yes, you came, you filled in the affidavit, we appreciate that, we're probably going to ask you to come back. 
Um, we know of at least one individual who has had a fraudulent return filed with her name on it, um, and we anticipate that that individual may have to meet with the IRS on multiple occasions. We believe that the need for this leave can be fairly easily documented. Individuals can provide copies of their correspondence that they receive from the IRS and request for a grant of business leave in order to take this, attend to this business. Um, and again, as to the issue of timeliness, this is something that is happening to our members on an ongoing basis. Um, and we did expect that it will continue to happen for an ongoing basis for some time to come. The third thing that we are asking for is development of a policy and training for employees who are responsible for safeguarding confidential employee data to ensure that confidential employee data is protected from future release. What we're looking for is something that would, that would help prevent this from happening again on an employee standpoint. One aspect of this situation that is often overlooked and that is very unfortunate is the two individuals lost their jobs. And they lost their jobs not because they did something malicious or mean or awful, but for doing what they thought was the correct thing. They thought they were responding to a request from the superintendent to provide documents. Had there been a policy in place related to the protection of the information being requested, or had there been some sort of safeguards that they were required to follow, those folks, those folks might still have their jobs today. And these people may not have had their information breached. Protection of confidential employee information is an ongoing obligation of the district. The Commissioner of Education has acknowledged on multiple occasions that ongoing and continuous violations are grounds for allowing a grievance to proceed. We are of the opinion that the events and the incidents associated with this grievance are ongoing and will continue to be ongoing for many of your employees perhaps for years to come. What we are asking for is that the district acknowledge that this is not a one-time event, that, the, that it's an ongoing event, and that it should put steps into place to help the employees who have been affected and who will continue to be affected um, going forward. Thank you very much. Good evening again. Um, in January, I learned that a targeted sphere phishing email message had been sent to a business office employee requesting W-2 information. The email used my name um, to request employee W-2 information, which included employee names, addresses, social security numbers, and earnings information. Unfortunately, our employee replied to the message and attached approximately 1,700 W-2s for current and former employees for the calendar year 2016. The affected employees had opted to receive printed w -2, uh, W-2s instead of accessing them electronically via our financial software system. Not all employees were impacted. Protecting our employees' privacy is an important responsibility, and I take it very seriously. As soon as I learned about the breach, I worked closely with my staff to ensure that we notified all of our employees of the data breach as quickly as possible. We also notified federal, state, and local law enforcement and taxing authorities. Once we provided formal notice to all of our employees in February, we continued to communicate with our employees throughout the spring semester, answering their questions and providing them information. We were unaware that any of Belton ISD's TCTA members were unhappy, and to date, other than Rosemary Hans, who has been named in this grievance, we've received no TCTA member complaint other than the complaint received on June 21st, 2017, months after we informed our staff of the data breach. When we receive a grievance, our first step is to review board policy concerning the process, and we do our very best to follow the board's policy carefully. Because we determined that TCTA's complaints were not filed by the deadline established by board policy, the complaints were dismissed. At this time, I would like to ask Dr. Muller, our deputy superintendent, to review the relevant, relevant dates with you and explain the basis of our decision. Dr. Muller considered TCTA's level two appeal. Dr. Muller.
Okay, as Dr. King Cannon has indicated, the administration strictly follows board policy regarding the consideration of all formal grievances. Uh, the guiding principle of the board's policy is to address all concerns informally as soon as possible to allow for early resolution at the lowest possible administrative level. However, when a formal grievance is filed, the administration follows the formal process as set out in the board's policy, starting with consideration of the timeliness of the complaint. Now, your board policy <coughs> is pretty clear on timeliness, and it says it requires that formal complaints must be filed within 15 days of the date the individual first knew or with region, reasonable diligence should have known of the decision or action giving rise to the complaint. Board policy also goes on to state all time li limits must be strictly followed unless modified by mutual written consent. And then according to policy, if the complaint is not timely filed, the complainant, the complaint may be dismissed at any point during the complaint process. Now, the TST or TCTA complaint arises from events well beyond the 15-day deadline. And for that reason, we informed TCTA that the complaints were untimely and would not be heard. We also informed TCTA that they, would that they could appeal that decision, which they have done. Uh, because we're focusing on the timeliness of the complaint, I'd like to review some of the key dates. January 27, 2017, on this date, as you heard earlier, the, the district experienced a data breach that compromised the confidentiality of employees' W-2s. No later than February 7th, all affected employees were inform informed of the breach and provided with an opportunity to enroll in two years of credit monitoring and identity theft resolution services. On May 16th, 2017, according to Ms. Leahy, TCTA held a meeting for its members employed by Belton ISD to discuss the issues related to the data breach. On June 21st, 2017, TCTA's first complaint, which is found in tab one of your notebook, um, was filed. June 21st is five months after the data breach and almost six weeks or 25 business days after the meeting with Belton ISD employees who are members of TCTA. On June 27th, TCTA's second complaint, which is found in tab three of your binder, is 29 business days after TCTA admitted that they knew of the employees' issues related to the, to the data breach. Upon receipt of these complaints, we inform TCTA that um, the board policy uh, and particularly the 15-day deadline was discussed or, or uh, submitted to TCTA. Now, TCTA is, uh, is appealing the decision to, uh, that these complaints were considered untimely. So tonight, like the level one and level two hearings held prior to tonight, I'm only gonna address the timeliness issue. So during the level one hearing, Mr. Schiller clarified that Ms. Leahy knew her members' concerns on May 16, 2017. She explained that she had hosted a meeting with the Belton chapter of TCTA regarding the situation on May 16, and it was on that date, according to Ms. Leahy, that some TCTA members told her they would like to file a grievance. Now this is in the transcript that is provided to you, and I call your attention to tab five on page four the level one hearing transcript. So if you want to turn to that, it's page 412. And Mr. Schiller states, so you're talking mid-May then? And Ms. Leahy says, that would be, be when I had the meeting with Belton CTA regarding the situation. Yes, that's when they told me at that point they would like to file a grievance. And then you see further down the page, there's some clarification on what is that date and on the next page, on 5 of 12, it talks about that date was May 16th. One minute remaining. Uh, then at, during the level two hearing, Ms. Leahy confirmed that she actually knew of the TCTA members' complaints prior to May 16th. And you can find that on tab nine, uh, page four. She went on to, desc to describe some of the issues discussed at that May 16th meeting. 
including which employees have been contacted by the IRS and whether the employees were treated the same. So I would point out that no uh, employees have appeared with Ms. Leahy at either level one or level two, or I believe tonight. Um, although she names Rosemary Hans a teacher at Bex, Ms. Hans has never appeared with her, nor has any other employee. I recommend that you uphold the administration's decision at level two that this complaint was not timely filed. Is that all? Yes. Complete. Ms. Uh, Leahy, you have three minutes remaining. <clears throat> the administration's dismissal of our complaint based on timeliness rests on an assumption that what we are complaining about is the data breach. Uh, and that's incorrect. What we are complaining about here um, are the remedies that have been offered by the district in order to correct the data breach. Uh, and those remedies, first of all, were learned of after the data breach at various times by various members. The dates that were stated by the administration are correct, and we do not dispute them. However, even after that May meeting, I can tell you that some of the members that um, I spoke with were first contacted by the IRS as an initial matter or were contacted and asked to come as a follow-up meeting. So these are things that happen on an ongoing basis. Another thing that happened after the May meeting was that the grievance learned that their data had been breached by TASB. Uh, they were offered a year of Experian credit monitoring by TASB as a result of this data breach. And it became apparent at that point that the remedy initially offered by the district of the Experian credit monitoring had become redundant. Um, and one of the things that we asked for in the level one grievance, I believe, was that the credit monitoring run consecutively for two years instead of concurrently for one. Uh, the reason that we asked that at that time was because the filing of the, 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 the breach of the TASB data um, information was a factor for some folks in filing the grievance. But most importantly, I think that we need to understand that the Commissioner of Education has acknowledged that ongoing violations do allow for the filing of a grievance. Um, and the reason for that is because it, the Commissioner has acknowledged that some situations evolve and some situations continue. And that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, one, it, one thing that was brought up by administration during the course of this grievance process was that Ms. Hans, thank you, has not been contacted by the IRS. That doesn't mean she won't be contacted by the IRS. So what the district is saying, in effect, is that it then becomes incumbent on every single person who wants to complain to complain once they are contacted by the IRS or at some point in the future. What we are saying is let's be proactive. Let's address this. Let's say our employees have been damaged. We want to help them. We want to fix the situation. Let's do that. I am here because they asked me to be here, and they have told me what they are looking for from the district. So I am one person, but I represent many. Thank you very much. Administration, you have two minutes. Um, I just want to tell the board that I've reviewed all of the materials that have been presented um, to you tonight, and I concur with the decisions made by Mr. Schiller and Dr. Muller at levels one and two. I ask the board to uphold the administration's decision at level two and dismiss TCTA's complaint as untimely. Again, I deeply regret that personal information of our employees was compromised. Protecting our employees' privacy is an important responsibility, and I take it very seriously. Thank you. Board members, do you have any questions for either party? I actually have a question. Uh, Ms. Leahy, um, you're representing Ms. Hans, and, and I understand that, that's specific, um, but it sounded like she hasn't had any kind of negative effect but, and there are others that you're saying you represent, but is there anybody else who has specifically authorized you to represent them who has had a problem? We represent, I mean, um, we're, and you may want to ask this while we need to explain the concept of associational standing. 
I'm asking you who you represent. I, I just want to clarify who you're representing. And have all of those members authorized you to be here? The CTA has authorized me to be here. So you're representing the organization? I represent Ms. Hahn and I represent the organization. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Any other questions from any other board member? It is now time for the board to deliberate. Prior to doing so, does the board wish to consult with me regarding any legal issues in the appeal? Yes. In that case, we will do so in closed session, but since I can't adjourn <laughs> us to closed session, I'll be quiet. Okay, well, it is 541, and the board will adjourn to closed session and consult with board trustees attorney regarding the appeal as provided for in sections 551.071 of the Texas Government Code. Uh, board is now reconvening in open session at 5.49 p.m. Is the recorder on? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, it is my recommendation uh, that the board dismiss TCTA's consolidated grievances untimely and uphold the administration's decision at level two. Is there a motion to approve? I have a motion for Mr. Cowan, a second for Mr. Norwood. Any other comments or discussion? Okay, this will be a roll call vote, so we'll go in order. Mr. Norwood? Yes, yes. or no? Yes. yes. <laughs> Voting for the motion or yes. against? Yes. I'm sorry. I need to say your name. and Janet Lee, yes. Mike. Mike Cowan, yes. Sue Jordan, yes. Leo Camden, yes. Ty Taggart, yes. And Randy Pittenger, yes. Uh, the motion is approved unanimously, and that closes uh, our action. Uh, the motion has passed. Consolidated grievance is dismissed. For the record, this announcement of the board's decision is made in the presence of the complainant, Ms. Leahy. And that concludes uh, this action. I will uh, add, on behalf of the board, um, our appreciation for the administration and specifically human resources efforts to provide assistance to our employees. Our employees' um, safety and um, uh, remedy of, of problems is of utmost concern to us. And so we do appreciate the efforts that you've made, including um, making sure that they were provided two years, which is essentially twice the standard of practice from every other uh, data breach that we're uh, hearing about in the media. Uh, and so we're appreciative of the efforts, and we will ask that the Human Resources Administration continue to support uh, our uh, staff in having the training they need and having the support they need to find remedies to uh, any problems that they may encounter in the future. So thank you very much for that. Okay, we will take a brief break so we can get our students out in the hall because uh, we're going to recognize some students. Uh, it is 551, and this is don't leave. We're just going to take a couple of minutes to, uh, to get them in. Thank you, Ms. Lady, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Spaulding. Thank you. Okay, we're going to come back from our break, if you will. I'm not your break, but go, if, if you all want to have the students come in, they're welcome to while... We talk that won't won't bother us. Uh, does any board member have any item from the consent agenda you'd like pulled for discussion? Hearing none, I, I do want to uh, say so we're going to pull items J and K uh, off until we actually take action on the employment of uh, that individual. Uh, seems appropriate. Other items on the consent agenda, the minutes of the previous meetings, September 11, 2017, special meeting, September 18, 2017, regular meeting, the unaudited financial report for the month ending September 30th, 2017, gifts, grants, and bequests, uh, I believe that's on page 80, there you go, 81, thank you very much for those uh, donations. We have four expenditures over $50,000, all of which are planned and budgeted expenses, uh, and so previously uh, discussed, we have the E-rate Category 2 Enterprise Wireless Project Year 2 for NetSync Network Connections, $423,120.48. We have the 2017 District Computer Lab and Computer Library Upgrades, $90,914. We have the 2017 District uh, VOIP uh, Phone Upgrades, $91,922.40. 
We have the storage area network SAN lifecycle net, uh, or NetSync network solutions as part of the DR cooperative purchasing agreement at a cost of $284,463.28. And we have the summary of the 2017 tax roll for Belton ISD this is received from the Bell County Appraisal District. Uh, approved the summary of the 2017 tax roll presented by the Bell County Tax Appraisal District in accordance with section 26.09E of the property tax code. We have the Rogers, Morris, and Grover LLP engagement letter. We have the final plats of the BISD FM 2483 edition and the BISD Carriage House edition within the city of Temple, Texas uh, to approve that final plat uh, and authorize Randy Pittenger, board president, to sign the dedications and plats on behalf of the board. We have the petition requesting annexation by the city of Belton, Texas, of 41.08 acres of land, more or less, out of the James P. Wallace survey, abstract number 906 in Bell County, Texas, being part of a 109.18 acre track owned by Belton ISD located on Shanklin Road and Loop 121. We've talked about that when we purchased that property, that we wanted all of the property to be within the city, and, and the city has initiated annexation proceedings. We have the resolution for appointment to the Tax Appraisal District of Bell County Board of Directors. Um, Robert Jones has served in that capacity for uh, several years. Uh, that position, this position is jointly represents Belton ISD and the city of Belton, and so uh, we both uh, have to agree and both appoint. A recommendation is to appoint Christopher Floor, and we appreciate Chris's willingness to serve in that and, and express our appreciation to Robert Jones for his service on behalf of our community. Again, we're going to skip J and K. Please remind me to do that. We have uh, uh, next item is the selection of the competitive sealed proposals as the construction delivery method for the Belton High School roofing project, Project C, summer 2018, and authorize the superintendent to issue a request for proposals for the project, a selected committee to evaluate and rank the proposals and bring the recommendation rankings back to the board for approval. We have a memorandum of agreement with Education Service Center Region 12 regarding Skyward student software support. Is there a motion to approve consent agenda? I have a motion from, uh, from Mr. Camden, second from Mr. Taggart. All in favor of the motion, raise a hand. Passes unanimously. How are we doing on time? Three minutes. Everybody here to be rec two that we're recognizing? I don't wanna, I don't wanna miss anybody. Okay, well, I don't want to recognize, I don't want to miss anybody. So since we said six, we'll, uh, we'll go, let's see, what should we talk about next? <laughs> hey, let's do employment. You're going to start that? I would you want to start that? Let's, rec that. let's do some employee, because that's um, kind of a fun. I'm happy to do this one. In fact, I think I'll go to the podium there. Well, I'll start um, with personnel this evening. Um, I just want to recommend um, Jennifer Land as our new CFO for Belton ISD. Jennifer's in the back there. Stand, Jennifer. Please stand would up. You be recognized for the board. Um, Jennifer comes highly recommended to Belton ISD from the Texas Association of School Business Officials. Um, she has extensive knowledge and skills in a and a financial background with over 16 years of experience in public school districts. Um, she has a, a bachelor's degree and a ma master's de degree in business administration, University of Texas, uh, Mrs. Lee. And she's a licensed certified public accountant and a registered Texas school business administrator. Um, and we feel confident that she has the skills um, that she needs to continue to help us strengthen our business practices, and it's my pleasure to recommend her this evening. Her husband, Rudy, is a teacher and a coach at Lake Belton Middle School, so she'll be joining him in the school district. So it's my honor to recommend Jennifer. Jennifer, you want to say anything? Well, come on up. We're not going to let you get away. <laughs> Just sit and wait in the back. Come on up here. I had the opportunity to visit with Jennifer briefly before the meeting, uh, so I want to welcome you here, but I want to give you an opportunity to speak. Thank you. Good evening, President Pittenger, board members, and Dr. Kincannon. I am so thrilled to be here, to be part of the Belton Tiger family. 
which that may be changing, I guess, maybe <laughs> later on. We'll see about that. Not, no, the tiger wait, part. Wait the tiger part. <laughs> I'm not quitting. I'm not. I'm just, you haven't even improved me yet. <laughs> but I am thrilled to be here. I was telling President Pittenger earlier that my my uh, high school alma mater is red, red, so I'm used to saying go big red, so I'm excited about that. But more importantly, I have a passion for kids. I am in school business because of that, because I love children and the recognition part of the board meetings, that's always my favorite part. Because even though I'm not in the classroom directly, I know that everything we do as school business employees will impact children in some way or another. So just know that everything I do is simply because I want to make kids successful and the people who are touching and reaching our kids, they need to know that as well. So thank you. You're in the right place because that's how we feel and that's what we say. We're about to get to our favorite part, uh, recognizing our students, but, but you, you're joining a strong team who've done great things, but we're excited about how you take us to the next level and bring new things and, and new perspectives to us to help us get even better. So you'll hear a little bit later our first report, which hard to beat, but we uh, have high expectations from our business office and look forward to what you bring. You come highly recommended and with impeccable recommendations. So I uh, commend you for that and thank you for your willingness to come join us. So. Thank you for having me, and it's going to be great. It's going to be great. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Mr. Schiller, you want to give us the right? Okay, y'all can clap for her. That's fine. Okay, Mr. Schiller, why don't you give us the rest of the report, and then we'll act all, on all that, to all the recommendations. Absolutely. The other recommendation we have tonight is uh, Timothy Goodridge for Assistant Principal Belton High School. Timothy is here with us tonight. Mr. Goodridge, <clears throat> stand up. Come on now. Bachelor's degree in you history. Go. He has a master's of education. Um, has eight years of experience and has been with us for five years, and we're looking forward to uh, working with uh, Tim in his new role. And, and he is not unfamiliar to the board because he's been here. He's been one of our teachers of the year. He's a highly respected and, and acclaimed teacher, and so look forward to your opportunity there. I guess I should, you want to say anything? You got anything? <laughs> okay. <laughs> got you. Didn't want to put you on the spot, and Jennifer Lynn's going to be a hard act to follow, it looks like. So. <laughs> Uh, okay, anything else yep. we need? Those are the recommendations for now. Um, this month we also did uh, hire a, a teacher and um, have uh, three resignations uh, that are included in the report. And just as a reminder, last month we changed our policy to where that does not take board action for us to hire, but we do have the recommendation for these two administrative positions. So is there a motion to approve? I have a motion for Ms. Lee. A second for Mr. Cowan. Any other comments or questions? All in favor of the motion, raise a hand. Pass it unanimously. Welcome. Thank you for your willingness to serve our students. We appreciate you, and we look forward to what you bring to make us even better and help us serve our students in an even greater way. Um, okay, thank you, Todd. Now, let's get to the recognitions, because I think everybody's here and we've, we've, oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. I need to pick up these two items on the uh, consent agenda. The resolution designating signatories for text pool, local government pool investment counts, and the designation of signatories for first public Lone Star local government pool investment accounts. Both of those are for Jennifer Land. So we wanted to hire her before we did that. Is there a motion to approve? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, motion from Ms. Jordan, second from Mr. Cowan. Any other questions or comments? All in favor of the motion, raise a hand. Pass it unanimously. Now let's recognize students and staff. And I'm gonna start. You're gonna start, okay. Oh, everybody has something. I'm going to start us off with um, some of the, the best news um, ever um, <laughs> about our National Merit semifinalist, Serena Shador. Serena, why don't you come on up and stand up front? There you go. Come on. All right, straight up front, and, then we, and uh, Mr. Camden will join you there. Serena Shador is a senior at Belton High School. Um, she earned a perfect score on the ACT and has been selected as a National yep, Merit Semifinalist um, for her performance on the PSAT uh, last year as an 11th grader. Um, to qualify as a National Merit Semifinalist, Serena's high scores on the PSAT placed her in the top 1% of more than 1.6 million students who took the test last fall 
Um, and as the next step in the scholarship competition, it's awkward, isn't it? She's we're, talking I'm, about you, so we want you to stand up here the whole time she talks about you. <laughs> yeah, we're, I'll, have, I'll come join you in just a second. Um, Shador will, <laughs> she will be submitting essays, recommendations, and additional test scores to the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. And finalists will be announced between April and June of 2018. Um, she earned the highest possible ACT composite score of 36, an accomplishment that less than one-tenth of one percent of students who take the ACT achieve on average. Less than one-tenth of one percent. Pretty impressive. In the U.S. high school graduating class of 2016, only 2,235 out of nearly 2.1 million graduates who took the ACT earned a, a perfect score of 36. So congratulations to Serena. We have a special, um, something that we're starting this year that Serena gets to be the very first one. And we're going to award her with a special banner that will hang in Belton High School with her picture and her name on it. So we're gonna roll that out. Um, Dr. Love Smith, come on up because this is all about academics. We're gonna take a picture. This is Serena. a serious photo op. We are really proud of you. And we are going to brag on you all we can. And I think there that deserves go. a standing ovation. I want to see this. Good job. Look at this. Check this out. <laughs> Get over there by that banner. Okay, this is a really big deal, guys. I hope you had an opportunity to read some of the articles or see her video. Uh, an extraordinary accomplishment by an extraordinary student who has great things ahead. I'm going to let Serena introduce her parents. This is a really big deal. <laughs> yes, is a big deal, and it's a parent celebration time. Mom and Dad. That would be recognized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great job. Congratulations. We're proud of you. We have a little video of Serena talking about how she did all of this. Um, if we can show that clip. I took the SAT in middle school like as a seventh or eighth grader. So I knew like it was encouraging to see like I did well on this test, even as a seventh grader, but I can do even better. And so um, I like actually, like I bought an SAT book, prep book in middle school, even though I um, wasn't gonna take it soon. But like, I just knew that that was in the back of my mind. And like I signed up for like the SAT question of the day, which was like very manageable. And I didn't like spend like two hours every night for four years studying. But I think just like having that goal in the back of your mind, that like in, even doing well in your classes and studying for classes will benefit you in other areas such as like your SAT or your ACT or your PSAT. I, um, well, when I took the uh, PSAT like in 10th grade, I, I saw like I compared my scores. Like for example, my math score was a little lower than like my English score. So I knew like I needed to work my math. So I, I like I um, bought a book specifically for math and it had a bunch of math drills and like they had algebra and geometry. So like I realized like especially um, like geometry was like harder for me, I guess, than algebra. So like I knew that I would need to work on geometry drills and I practiced a lot of that. And then um, just practice tests were really helpful. And a lot of them are free. Like if you Google practice tests, they will um, appear and you can print them off and you can take them. Like I would write down like on this practice test, I made this score and um, because I missed these concepts, like because I forgot about this geometric formula and like in the and then, and then I would know in the future like what I needed to study to do better. I would say set a goal. Like they may have a goal score for their college they want or a goal score for a program or like a scholarship. So um, they need to like compare that goal with what they currently are like t testing on practice tests or what they have in the past. And so like they need to like see this gap and realize that like it is something that they can change and improve. And so um, 
they need to find ways, like specific ways. It's not just like, oh, read a book and you're going to improve, or oh, study more. Like, they need to find tangible ways to improve that goal, which is like taking a practice test every weekend or um, doing like asking your math teacher for help in concepts that you don't remember from middle school or things like that that can really like um, improve your score. I definitely meant to do um, I think that some people see like high scores or like national merit is only if they're like some prodigies that like often random parts of the area like the state but I think like it's um, I only achieved it because I studied it's not I didn't like just wake up and take it and I got this great score like it was just because I worked hard and so I think that like if the juniors study for the PSAT um, and the sophomores study for their PSAT like they can achieve it and I think that like when the district implements new programs to help them um, score higher it really can like help them in their scores. are really like crucial like to colleges and they're looking for applicants um, and so they like will email me or like send me mail and they'll, like say like based on your school scores to qualify for this or like based on your GPA and your ACT score you can get a full ride and so I think it's it's really um, nice to know that like colleges appreciate like your work and like it pays off to like study and get a good score because I can go to more like prestigious colleges or I can go to a college for um, cheaper for free because of my scores. Like they've waived my application fee waivers and like they've um, or like they've given me streamlined applications so they know that like since I have higher scores um, I'm a top applicant to them and so I can get priority consideration for scholarships and priority uh, consideration for admission and so it's cheaper and it's easier and it's faster for a lot of schools based on the scores that um, college board or the ACT shows them. I would say that it's definitely something you can prepare for. It seems very challenging, like something that you can't conquer, I guess. Like, it's like, but it is something that you can control and it does depend on you. Like the amount of effort and study time you put into it will pay off because if you, if you never study, you're probably not going to do as well as you could. And so there's always room for um, improvement based on like how much work you put into it. My name is Serena Shador. I'm a senior at Belton High School. I am a National Merit semifinalist, and I achieved a perfect score in the ACT. Awesome. <laughs>Great job. Uh, Congratulations. And I think Serena that. can go anywhere she wants to go anywhere. to college. And I think Rice University is in the at the top of her list right now. But that That's so great. Yeah. Congratulations. We're so She's proud of you. And, of and I ex I'm, I'm looking forward to you coming back as a finalist. Yeah. Come back and we'll <laughs> congratulate you again. Well, um, Serena, Serena did very well. But we have some other students who achieved some great results on the PSAT last year also. We have four more seniors that we'd like to recognize this evening as um, commended scholars um, for their their achievement. Madeline Finley, Jacob Kyle, Alec Ramba, up. and Katherine Shelburne. Would you come forward? I, I didn't mention this earlier, but parents, please feel free to come up and take pictures. We're going to take an official picture to put on our website and, and brag uh, through our website and our social media, but we want you to do that too. So y'all come on back up here, come up and uh, I think Dr. Kincan is going to talk about you a little bit too while we take a picture of you. Yeah, these, um, I told you there were millions of students, um, about a million and a half students who take the PSAT um, National Merit Qualifying Test. And of those, um, about 34,000 are identified all across the country as commended students. And we have four of them right here in Belton ISD. And they too, will, because of their high achievement, will qualify for admission into some, some top universities in the country, wherever they want to go. And they'll get some nice scholarships as a result of that as well. Um, depending on the university, and we have a banner for them as well. The that banner, we'll bring on the banner! Come on, get that banner up here in the photo op. Yeah, that's a, okay. You're gonna have to redo all those pictures now. The banner's in. Okay, these banners are pretty cool, right? 
And I don't know where they're going, but uh, that's going to be fun. Front lobby. Front lobby on display. Bragging rights. We are really proud of you and excited about this way of recognizing you. And we just want you to know how proud we are of the effort you've put forth to achieve this level of commendation. Take as many pictures as you want, folks. We can wait for pictures. Where are y'all going to school? Want to go to school? Top choice? Okay. DCU, all right. There you go. And I love that picture. Students with attitude, I love it. <laughs> parents, there you go, parents. Congratulations, we are really proud of you. So exciting uh, to see this kind of uh, achievement by our students. It's a goal of Thank ours. You, Mrs. Dr. Gordon for joining us. Yeah. is also gonna be talking about this. Are you gonna talk about it now? Uh, no, this I'm gonna save that agenda. for my superintendent's report, but this is, I will remind everyone, and we our principals have been talking about, this is one of our highest priorities That's right. in Belton ISD. We wanna stretch all of our students, including our top students, and so we have five Students in that picture this year. We want some more next year. There you go. Working hard to get them there. All right, we'll hear more about, about the efforts in there, but let's recognize some more students in a different area who have achieved great things. Our FFA State Convention Awards. Good evening. Um, in addition to being the sixth largest in the state, the Belton FFA chapter continues to be one of the most celebrated. At the Texas FFA convention held this past July in Corpus Christi, the Belton chapter received the Golden Horizon Award for the multi-teacher division. The highest state rating given to a chapter this award recognizes exceptional chapter involvement and activities. Eight students received the Lone Star FFA degree, which is given to FFA members who have been active in the organization for at least two years, meet academic criteria, and demonstrate leadership skills. The Belton students receiving the degree were Rachel Barnett. If y'all can start. Oh, come on up. Here. Rachel Barnett, Joel Harden, Francesca Harden-Landon, Kyle Hobbs, Ruben Latimer, Eric Martinez, Eric O'Braden, and Maddie Sage. Additionally, student Tyree Ransom, who has graduated and moved on, placed 11th statewide in extemporaneous speaker competition. The advisors for the Belton FFA chapter are Brad Hobbs, Josh Flowers, Mitchell Hill, Jeff Heffernan, and Annie Fogel. Congratulations. All right, so, so uh, and sponsors, come on, are you gonna take pictures? You can come up and be part of a picture. You can do both, yeah, right? Let me, let me okay, let's, let's get them in. We're gonna take a picture, but we want our, our advisors, I said sponsors, our advisors, are you representing the advisors tonight? Everybody else is great. Well, thank you for being here and you'll take care of these certificates for those who aren't here. You know, our FFA program has a history of being strong and a great legacy of excellence. And it's a great opportunity for our students to uh, achieve some leadership recognition. Congratulations. Thanks for representing us at State. Good job, guys. Always time for one more photo op. <laughs> All right. Well, the uh, Temple Rotary Club uh, recognizes an educator of the month. All right, and we have another outstanding educator which helps create that foundation for our kids and Kevin Possible. Kevin, come on up. Kevin's a seventh grade English language arts teacher at Lake Belton Middle School and he's in his fifth year in education, all with Belton. Mr. Possible is an energetic classroom leader who inspires. His student-centered approach fosters creativity, expression, leadership, and growth. And students know that Mr. Postville believes in them, and they work to make him proud. Kevin has taken on the coordination Chris, of the LBMS academic UIL team, and participation has drastically increased. Mr. Hobson, principal at Lake Belton, stated, Mr. Postville is an exceptional teacher that has the ability to truly light up a classroom with inspiration. He maintains a positive attitude e even in the face of adversity. 
leads by serving and continuing continually strives for success. His actions reflect his desire to give back and influence positive change in the world around him. And it's my understanding you've already gotten to have lunch with the superintendent and the Rotary Club, so congratulations. He did, and I learned, some, I learned something really neat about Kevin. He was a sports writer for the Clean Daily Herald. Um, before he got into teaching, and um, and I think that's pretty neat. And uh, cross the great divide. A great job of helping our kids <laughs> learn to write, which is another one of our exactly focus very areas. important. So, awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Great. Congratulations. And again, thank you to the Temple Rotary Club for their sponsorship of this. Dr. Muller, you want to help us recognize our awesome principals? We are so fortunate to have strong educational leaders at our all of our campuses, and and this is a good time to pause and recognize them. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, the governor has declared October as Principals Month. His proclamation reads in part, as school leaders, principals are entrusted with our most valuable resource, our next generation of leaders. These students are a promise for our, our future, and it is critical that they receive a rigorous and well-rounded education. At this time, I encourage all Texans to acknowledge the important role principals play in ensuring that every child has an access to high quality education. So as I call your name, if you would come to the front. So our Belton ISD principals are Sue Banfield, Belton Early Childhood School. If you'll hold your applause to the very end, that'd be great. We can clap for Sue, come on. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth McMurtry, Chisholm Trail Elementary. Elizabeth. Amy Armstrong, High Point Elementary. <laughs> Tiffany Weiss, Leon Heights Elementary. Judy Schiller, Lakewood Elementary. Jennifer Connor, Miller Heights Elementary. Rebecca Vaughn, Pertle Elementary. Stacy Cox, Southwest <laughs> Elementary. Julie Manley, Sparta Elementary. Michelle Tisch, Tarver Elementary. Chris Hobson, Lake Belton Middle School, Joe Brown, North Belton Middle School, Kevin Taylor, South Belton Middle School, Chris Dubois and Jill Ross, Belton High School, Ben Smith, Belton New Tech High School at Wasco, and the coordinator for the DAEP or the Discipline Alternative Education Program is Amelia Olivares. Amelia, if you'll come up. Okay, y'all gonna have to crunch together here somehow. We have somebody to be up make here. two rows. Make two rows. Guys. Come on. Make. Y'all make two rows and, and and we'll keep talking about you a little bit. Uh, Chris is probably too tall for the mask. Yeah, there you go. This is on you. He's taller than the There, yeah, there you, you go, go, Chris. Chris. Doctor Duke. Yeah, Ladies is. and gentlemen, we are very fortunate in Belts and ISD to have strong educational leadership at our campuses, and these folks work many, many hours on behalf of our students. They have the job of being educational leaders and CEOs and building administrators and have wearing lots of hats, doing lots of things, all on behalf of our children. Thank you. We appreciate you. <laughs> what was that? And they have a little banter between them. <laughs> They're great. Okay, and uh, also, each month we like to recognize one of our Big Red community partners. We're so fortunate in Belton to have a strong and supportive community of our schools. And so tonight, we're going to give a Big Red community partner award to sure, Temple right. College. To Temple College, in keeping with the focus on high achieving academics, Temple College has been an integral part of Belton ISD's dual credit offerings. BISD students participating in Temple College offerings have the benefit of a great support system that meets monthly to see how the district and Temple College can better serve our students. This hands-on approach to supporting our students allows for long-term impacts. This year alone, Temple College has connected BISD students with 529, again, 529 three-hour credits just this year. These college credit opportunities have taken the support of many at Temple College, including their board of trustees, administration, and faculty. Dr. Dan Spencer, Associate Vice President, and Kristen Griffith, Director of Dual Credit, are here to accept the recognition of Temple College as this month's Big Red Community Partner. Thank you. Thank you all.
great opportunity for our students to get dual credit and, and get a head start on their college uh, experience. And, and we're so fortunate to have a great partner in Temple College. Thank you very much for that. Um, Listen, I just wanted to mention uh, a couple of other things just to make sure the board is aware. Uh, the Belton Education Enrichment Foundation had a tremendous red carpet event last week. I haven't heard the final numbers yet, still waiting on them to get all the proceeds in, but just a great event to, to provide funds for teacher grants and student scholarships and, and so thankful for, again, how our community came together to support our students. And also, um, just in case you haven't seen on social media, our Marching 100 has had two consecutive weekends. Uh, last weekend, they were the champions of the Midway Marching Preview, and this weekend, they were uh, a finalist at the prestigious Texas Marching Classic down in Round Rock, uh, all getting ready for district that's coming up this next weekend. Really uh, significant, a lot of hours uh, by those students and, and the parents uh, and, uh, and, and the band boosters role. So we're very appreciative of their work and, and excited about what's coming. Next, next Saturday. Next Saturday, next Saturday, the 21st. All right, so, and that's all I've got. Did I miss everybody? We get them all recognized? Thank you all. You're m more than welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting, by the way, but I also understand <laughs> that you high-achieving students don't want to go study. And so we understand if you, if you leave before we get on with the rest of our meeting. Uh, but again, you're welcome to stay. Okay, we do need to uh, pick back up, and I want to go back to uh, our public hearing regarding the 2017 School Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas, or the first report. Deanna Clavel is going to give that report, and so it is 625, and we will uh, call that public hearing to order. Thank you, Deanna. Yes, thank you, Mr. Pittenger, Board of Trustees, Dr. Kincan, and I appreciate the introduction. Um, this is a public hearing as required to discuss the 2017 School's First Financial Accountability Rating System of Texas, also known as the FIRST Report. The FIRST Report was adopted during the 1999 legislative session and was implemented in 2003. The district staff, student and financial data is reported to the state through the Public Education Information Management System of Texas, also known as PEMS. In 2015, the first rating guidelines were restructured. These changes were authorized by House Bill 5, Section 49, as part of the 83rd legislative session. House Bill 5 amended Section 39.082 of the Texas Education Code to require the Commissioner of Education to include processes in the rating system for anticipating future financial solvency of school districts. In 2017, first was the third and final phase that was implemented for this last year. The new ruling and includes 15 indicators and required a comparison of higher scores to previous years. A district's financial accountability rating is identified as an A through D letter grade. A is equal to a superior rating and is the highest rating possible. A D is a substandard achievement and is the lowest rating that can be received. In order for a district to receive an A or a superior rating on the first report, they must have received a 90 or higher as their overall score. The first five indicators are a yes-no response, which generates a pass-fail for the first part of the first report. The Belton Independent School District has a response of yes to all five of these indicators that are part of this section. Indicator one, identifies that the district has submitted their annual financial report to TEA by the required deadline of January 28th. Indicator 2.A identified that an unmodified opinion was provided by the external auditor for the annual financial report ending August 31st, 2016. Indicator 2B identifies that the annual financial report was free of any instance of material weakness. Indicator 3 identifies that the Belton Independent School District is in compliance with the payment terms of all of its debt agreements. Indicator 4 identifies that Belton Independent School District made timely payments to the Teacher Retirement System, the Texas Workforce Commission, and the IRS, as well as other governmental agencies. 
Indicator 5 identifies Belton Independent School District as having 13.87% increase in student membership over a five-year period, and meeting this criteria automatically passes the indicator for the district. Indicator 6 calculates the cash on hand for the district. The Belton Independent School District has 93.7 days cash on hand as of August 31st, 2016, and therefore, according to the scale, allows us to receive 10 full points for this indicator. Indicator 7 calculates the district's debt ratio. Belton Independent School District has a debt ratio of 4.0732, and according to the scale, allows us to receive 10 points for this indicator as well. Indicator 8 determines that the district had a change in student membership of greater than 10% over five years and automatically passes this indicator for the district. Indicator 9 reviews whether or not the district had general fund revenues that were equal to or greater than its expenditures or that the cash on hand was greater than 60 days at year end. The Belton Independent School District has cash on hand of greater than 90 days as identified in the earlier indicator and the revenues exceeded the expenditures at year end. Therefore, we received the full 10 points. Indicator 10 determined that the Belton Independent School District had a debt service coverage ratio that was sufficient to, to meet the required debt service. Indicator 11 calculates the district's administrative cost ratio. The Belton Independent School District has an administrative cost ratio of 7.86%. Belton Independent School District also had an average daily of, of average daily attendance, excuse me, of 10,009, which placed the district under a more restrictive criteria to meet, and we were still able to receive the 10 full points. Indicator 12 is a student enrollment for BISD did not decrease, therefore we received 10 full points on this indicator. Indicator 13 identifies the information submitted to the PEAM system for the annual financial report, and our variance was less than 3%. Therefore, we received a 10 full points on this indicator. Indicator 14 states that the external auditor did not find any instance of material noncompliance and allowed us to receive a full 10 points. Indicator 15. The district did not receive an adjusted repayment schedule for more than one fiscal year due to an overpayment of the foundation school program, and therefore we received 10 points. The Belton Independent School District received 100 points out of a possible 100 points and has a superior achievement rating for the fiscal year 2015-2016. This is the sixth year in a row that the Belton Independent School District has received a perfect score on the first rating through TEA. The outline shown here identifies how the ratings have changed between the letter grades A through D. And you can see here that in the previous year, in order to receive a superior rating or an A on the first report, a minimum score of a 70 was required. And through the restructure process, you now have to receive a minimum score of 90 in order to receive a superior achievement rating. This concludes our public meeting on the first report. I'll open it to any questions or comments. Yeah, this is a public hearing, so anyone uh, wishing to ask a question or make a comment may do so. Uh, hearing none, does any board member have any question or comment? We'll just add our first aid and good report. Uh, obviously a very good report, well presented uh, report. Uh, we take very seriously our stewardship of public trust as trustees, um, and this is another indicator uh, that we are meeting that goal of being good stewards. So thank you for your work and, and everyone in the business office uh, effort, Dr. King Cannon, uh, everyone for your efforts to help us meet these standards. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. 6.33, and we will close this hearing, public hearing. Uh, next item.
Oh, next item, sorry, you, hang on, public comments. I want, I want to go back and try and pick everything up. I didn't, did anybody, uh, sign, I didn't see anybody sign up. Is anybody wishing to address the board at this time? Hearing no takers, we'll go on. There you go, superintendent's report. All right, um, I did have a couple of things to add on the PSAT and superintendent scholars. I just didn't have my notes up there, uh, up here with me a few minutes ago. Um, last Wednesday, all of our students in grades eight through 11 um, took the, PASA, the PSAT, and as you saw with Serena, the 11th grade is the National Merit Qualifying, um, National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test, the NMSQT. Um, and those are the, the highest scoring students in the 11th grade are the students who received that designation. Um, in the 10th grade, in Belton ISD, we recognize our highest achievers as superintendents scholars. Um, we've been recognizing our 7th grade students as junior scholars, and at the 10th grade level, we recognize superintendent scholars. And I just want to commend um, Christina Flores and Dr. Lovesmith for their work on our superintendent scholars program this year. Um, we made that a priority when we set some goals and we spent some time visiting with students this summer about what it means to be a National Merit Scholar and how they can um, raise their scores. In fact, we had a focus group meeting this summer and um, just talked to the students and we, we um, learned a lot um, from our kids about how busy they are, the number of courses and activities that they're in. Um, and we asked them what it would what would it take to get them to spend some more time preparing um, and we were we were planning to write an incentive program for them but they were um, they were so impressive we said why don't y'all write the pro your incentive program and bring it back and we'll talk about it so we had a second meeting with them um, and developed a program and implemented that this fall through last week's test um, and we'll be continuing to implement that plan as they, they did request some college visits from us. And so we'll be doing some additional things with those students. Um, but I'm really proud of Christina and Dr. Lovesmith for embracing that with me um, this fall. And um, we look forward to, to some great results as a, um, for that work. And Dr. Lovesmith will provide you with some more information here in a bit. Um, enrollment and demographic update next Friday is snapshot date, October the 27th. I think that's next Friday, maybe that's two Fridays. Um, we currently have 11,547 students enrolled. Um, that represents an increase of 431 students over last year. That's about a 3.7% increase overall. Um, as you know, our growth has been the greatest at the high school level, uh, where we currently have 3,382 high school students. And that represents about 5% of growth at the high school level. And I might remind you that this is a, a UIL realignment year, so our snapshot data that we submit to uh, TEA it will uh, will use the official count of the high school for our UIL realignment data, so that, that uh, 3,300 or 3,400, um, wherever we land on the 27th, will go to UIL for realignment in 18, 19, and 19, 20. So it won't impact our new high school um, yet, but it will be our last realignment before we open the new high school. Our percentage of economically disadvantaged students is approximately 42.6%. That's slightly down from last year's um, 45%. However, students are still submitting their paperwork for the free and reduced lunch program, and that number may change over the next um, several days as we approach snapshot date. Um, we have our 52% 52.6% white, 33.5% Hispanic, 6.8% African American. Um, we have 4.2% of our students who are uh, consider themselves as two or more races. 2% are Asian and 0.6% are considered American Indian. And our military connected student population is now about 8% of our total student enrollment. Um, so I'll provide you some more information next month after we um, take our official count on October the 27th, but I just wanted to give you an update. Significant growth this year in Belton ISD as we expected and planned for. That's all I have. 
thank you. I, a lot of numbers, and so I, I, I'm, I'll wait to see them. Uh, lot, lots of numbers. Uh, really excited about the efforts being made towards our uh, advanced academics and, and these students. Uh, great thing. So thank you. Thank You're you welcome. very much for that. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, uh, let me just mention, um, uh, I don't think she, uh, she'll be okay with me saying this. Sue Jordan just got a call from the hospital to go up there for her mother. Uh, she is critically ill, and so your thoughts and prayers for Sue and her family uh, would be appropriate this time and frankly makes everything we're going to do from this point forward uh, in perspective as not as important. So um, anyway, blessings for Sue. Um, but <laughs> on that transition, we have spent months gathering information, receiving feedback, uh, going through a, a process of discussion on an issue that is of uh, compelling public interest. Uh, we have had uh, a lot of response and a lot of interest in our community about the name, mascot, and colors for our new comprehensive high school. Uh, and uh, as we have said repeatedly since we've started this process, uh, this comes down to a choice. It's a decision and a choice that we're going to make. Uh, we have received input from um, hundreds of people in, a, in dozens of different avenues and venues, uh, but essentially it comes down to a choice. Um, I think it's worth repeating again. This does not have an impact on student achievement, the kind of things that, that we're talking about in some, both prior to this item and following this when we talk about some of the things that are going on. But it is something that's important to our community, and so uh, it's due our attention. So anyway, it is decision time. Um, we talked about this quite a bit last month. And so what I suggested at that time is that we come to a decision this month. This wasn't a little sooner than our original timeline, but I think that's appropriate. What I'd like to do, um, just to move through and see how fast we get there, uh, obviously with six of us, it might take a little longer to get to four, <laughs> but it takes four, a majority, to uh, uh, come to a conclusion. So we'll take the name first, we'll do the mascot next, and we'll do the colors third. Uh, and so we'll just kind of go around uh, in order. Um, and so, for example, uh, if we start with the name, I'll reiterate what I said last month, that um, I believe Belton should be at the beginning, and so, uh, and Lake was obviously something we got a lot of feedback on, and so uh, Belton Lakeview High School or Belton North Lake High School are the two that stood out to me. Belton Lakeview is, is my first choice. Mike? Well, um, oh, thank you again. I said Belton Lakeview High School was my first choice. Okay, Belton North Lake was my second choice. So um, if you want to do first, second, third, or just one, that's okay. We'll just and we'll see where we are. Let's just go around. Everybody say what they want, and then we'll see where we stand. Okay, well, and since, start taking looking for motions if we since can get there. Uh, last month's meeting. You know, my thoughts on the name. Uh, really haven't changed. I haven't had a lot of feedback from from anyone on anything different than what what I said last time. My my top choice is uh, Belton Lake High School, uh, followed closely by Belton Lake View High School. So those are my top two choices. Okay, Leo. I've had lots of input from lots of people, just like everybody else has, but. Uh... I'm still go back to the Belton Lake View is a, is a good one, but I, I still like uh, Lake Belton High School. So, Lake Belton. Lake Belton. Jeff. I guess for my number one choice, I uh, Lake Belton High School. Janet. My number one choice would be Belton Lake View High School, followed closely by. Belton Lake or Lake Belton High School, either one. Okay. Ty. Right. <clears throat> uh, my additionally, my first uh, instinct was Belton Memorial, but as I've gotten more and more community input, especially this last month, a lot more laser focus from people contacting me, I think Lake Belton will be my first choice based on responses that I've heard, and Memorial will be my second, would be my second choice.
Okay, so we're three and three, <laughs> <laughs> which is exactly kind of how that plays out. When And if Sue was here, I guess she might have gotten to, uh, or might have had something else. So at this point, uh, we have, I guess we can talk about this. It appears that we have three of us prefer Belton Lakeview and three of us prefer, um, well, actually, I say that, uh, uh, Lake Belton. There you go. And then Belton Lake is secondary. Y'all want to negotiate? How you want to do this? You want to take a vote and see who? Uh, I'll entertain a motion and we'll see if we'll get four votes. Um, or do you want to lobby for what you got? So it sound, we're narrowing this down. It, it does sound like. Uh, Belton Lakeview, Belton Lake. Or Lake Belton, I'm sorry. Yeah. Belton Lakeview, Lake Belton. So which comes first, Belton or Lake? Um, I like the B. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push for the B. It was, Leo was the other one besides me that said Lakeview. Lake Belton. Who else said Lakeview? Oh, I did. You said well, Lakeview. Yeah, Lake my View. second Lake choice View. was Belton Lakeview. What was your first choice, Mike? Belton Lake. Okay. Belton Lake. So, oh, yeah. you know what? so I think we have more Belton Lakes, don't we? No, we have Lake or Lake, I'm sorry, Lake Belton. Lake Belton. Belton Lake. That's right. I'm sorry. I wrote it down. Belton Lake. We have a, okay. Where's my secretary taking notes here? Lakeview. Belt, if you just go with first votes, Lakeview, Belton, Lakeview, Belton, Lake, Lake Belton, Lake Belton, Belton, Lakeview, Lake Belton. So there's three Lake Beltons, two Belton, Lake View, and one Belton, Lake. Thank you. That's correct. Um, so there are three votes for Lake Belton. Um, you know, if, uh, hey, Randy, during the process, the, the, the thing that kind of kind of got me on the Lake Belton was a suggestion that, that somebody that I really respect their opinion said, you know, when we play the Round Rock schools and you play like Stony Point or some of the others, uh, people drop the name Round Rock from the name and they just become locally as Stony Point or, you know, whatever some of those high schools are. And they said, if you want to keep Belton in the name where you've always got Belton in there, you go Lake Belton because they're always going to have to say Lake Belton High School. And I just said, you know, that we talked about how much it meant to have Belton in the name. And so that and that leaves it in there the whole time. They can't shorten it to have a nickname as although something. Our, although we do have, and, and I would say the other side of that, I've heard the other way is, well, we have a Lake Belton Middle School, and it's called Lake. I mean, it, it is referred to as Lake. And so, I, that frankly, that's my concern with using the same name that we have for a middle school, the confusion potential for a middle school and a high school with the same name, and that, that's why that is not um, the preferred. And I wanted to be first. So that's that's me, but I hear you. That's a reasonable argument. And I think we said that last so, time, and Jeff yep. said we had a Belton Middle School at one time. And yep. So and we, we had Belton well, yeah. High School yep. and Belton Middle School. Yep. That was another that's right. My, that's right. That's right. That's right. thought process, too. That is true. Good point. Anybody want to change a, a preference? Are we gonna, how are we going to reach an impact? Do you want to somehow? I'm not. If you want to. Uh, I'm not going to change my preference. I'll tell you that if anybody else wants to. I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how you're going to get, how we're going to get to four. So, anybody want to try? I'll change my preference. You'll change your preference to what? Uh, to to agree with the guys that, that want uh, Lake Belton. Okay. Are you making that in form of a motion? Sure. So, we have a motion for Miss Lee for to name the new high school Lake Belton High School. Is there a second to that motion? I have a second for Mr. Norwood. Any other comments? All in favor of that motion, raise a hand. We have four in favor, all opposed. That'd be uh, Mr. Callan and myself opposed. And we have a name for comprehensive high school number two, Lake Belton High School. All right, so let's talk about mascot. All right. Mascot next, let's go in reverse order. Ty, you get to go first. I like Broncos. Bronco, okay. <laughs> Janet. Broncos. Jeff, I'm going to go with Broncos, but I'm also going to give my reason because of all the discussions that have taken place and trying to tie, uh, keep it tied to Belton. I thought it was cool. I mean, I'm, I'm not a native to here, but even some of the natives didn't know the history. And, and I've actually been able to talk to people about that. They're like, well, why Broncos? I mean, Broncos has nothing to do with that. I was like, actually, if you go back in time, this is what was determined that, you know, the, the journal was called the Belton Bronco. It does have history to it. It's different. 
I like it. Ever since it came out, you know, I was I wanted the War Eagles. Nobody else backed me. <laughs> so that went over like the tree. Yeah, you notice I didn't say that much. So, uh, Broncos. I I I just think it really ties in the history uh, of the town. Okay. Um, well, well, it started off as Patriots. That that was my favorite going into this. Uh, me too. <laughs> Hang on, you had your. But uh, but uh, you don't ever interrupt Randy. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but since then, it's it, is, it has become Broncos. All right, Mike. Well, my again, first choice hasn't changed since last meeting. It remains Tigers. My second choice, close behind, is Broncos, because I like that. You know what Ty said last meeting about the uh, the rodeo tie-in, and I think we can create a sense of community in that area around mascots related to that so but tigers is my first choice okay my first choice is tigers because we asked for community input and the overwhelming input from the community was for tigers uh the only thing that was even close to a second was bengal tigers so um i'm gonna vote as a representative of the community those who uh have talked to me uh, and say tigers but clearly we have a majority for broncos so who wants to make the motion a motion for Mr. Taggart for Broncos to be the new mascot. Is there a second? Second for Mr. Camden. Any other comments or questions? All in favor of the motion, raise a hand. That four. All opposed? Mr. Cowan and myself. And that passes. Go Broncos. We have a name, Lake Belton. We have a mascot, Tigers. I do want to say. Broncos. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. It passed. We got, we got it on the right. You I know, do want to say that this, con this discussion will need to continue at some point in regard to our middle schools. It's not over. So we need to figure out a path of the best path forward yeah. in regard to our sports teams on our middle school level. Really a good, good point because we haven't drawn attendance boundaries. Obviously, that's premature. But, but assuming there are feeder patterns, then, then we'll want to bring this, that issue up. And so we'll need administration to... So and I also want to add, um, since Randy added his, his point of view, I'll add my point of view, which is um, up to this point, our decision, our decision was based on whether it was Tigers or not Tigers. And so to me, um, the overwhelming decision was that it should not be Tigers. Fair enough. It is Broncos. Okay, um, we'll start in the middle with colors. We have the Lake Belton Broncos, and now we need colors. Let's see, who's in the middle? Leo. I like red, white, and blue. Okay. Red, white, and blue. Okay. Um, Jeff. There you go. Uh, I like red, white, and blue. Oh, sorry. Red, white, and blue. Mike? I like red and silver. Uh, Ty. I guess it was two Thursdays ago. <laughs> this is one time I get to say something. So two Thursdays ago, I was at the pep rally. My daughter, Rebecca, was uh, doing the bells. And we sang the school song. And yes, I know all the words. My grandma taught them to me when I was a little kid. It was a big deal to stand there and know the words to the school song. And it says three times in the school song about red and white. And it talks about the boys, and it talks about the colors. And that was really, I guess, that was my moment right there, my moment that that belongs to Belton High School. And that's their legacy. And this is a time for new beginnings and a new legacy. And I don't want to take away from an old legacy and borrow from it. And I would like to start a new legacy for these new people that are coming on. So I think we've obviously gone in a different direction on the mascot. Uh, I would like to, I think we said something about take away the black and the white last time because they were, you know, auxiliary colors or whatever. I personally, and a lot of people have suggested this to me, with multiple mascots involved, but black be the primary color. I like black and silver. I think that's a, a they're strong colors. They go with Broncos. Uh, I'm not a Raiders fan, but the silver helmets and the silver pants look really cool. I like that. I think if you introduce the black as the main color, 
then you don't have two Go Big Reds, because to me, you'd only, you only have one Go Big Red in the district. It belongs to Belton High School and that legacy to me. That's just my opinion. I've heard that from a lot of old timers that believe that. They don't want to share. It's time for a new beginning. And so my thoughts are black and silver, uh, and that's where I'm at on that. Great. Janet? I like red and gold. Um, I just have to go with, with this particular subject. This one was truly overwhelming community support that we keep red as a primary color. I mean, I can totally see that. I personally can, since we've chosen a new mascot, I could totally see going with totally different colors. I think it could be done. It would be difficult, but we could do it. Um, but on this particular issue, I mean, it was, it was very high majority, keep red as a primary. People were not overwhelming that it needed to be red and white, but every, a lot of people wanted to keep the red. So for that reason, and also for future expense of changing out middle schools and any elementaries and things like that, um, it's cost effective to keep a red. It's a, it's a little odd, but I think with a good, strong secondary color that's different, I think, I think it's good. Red and gold. Great. And um, again, my answer is the same as it was for the other issues, uh, overwhelming community responses, red and uh, secondary color, as long as it's not white, I think that's also been strong, that it should be something different. Silver or gold's come out. Uh, I agree that we kind of said, well, black and white are kind of accent colors, so they're gonna be there regardless. So um, I was with the uh, silver and, or gold, and I don't really care, because we're a big red community, and I, my position from many old timers is this is the big red community and red belongs to the community not just the school particularly because we have changed the mascot I think it's especially important so it's red and I it, we don't have a consensus here so I don't know how we're going to get to our second one um, it obviously we have um, five of us with red is primary now um, so I guess I would probably say silver silver gray is my second secondary preference but I'd go with gold. I don't have a strong preference on that. Do y'all want to, what do y'all want to go with that? Just real quick. My second choice was red and gold and, and I'm good with both. Um, so I'd be happy to switch. Oh, to your second choice was gold. Red and gold. So is red and silver or red and gold? And yes. I'm, I would say the same thing. I'm red and silver or I, it doesn't matter to me what the second color is. My frankly. only issue with, with gold is just my opinion. I like the gold. I'm not saying that. I just, when you start talking about uniforms and things, there's always a thousand variations mm -hmm. of gold. And when you start trying to place all of that, it, it gets difficult. And so, um, so I mean, it goes from, you know, harvest yellow to, yeah. to yeah. gold, depending on the, where, what school district you're talking about and all that. Right. So, uh, And that may be why I was thinking that gold, because I've seen some gold I don't like and I've seen some I do like. So that's a, that's a good point. It, it changes, and that's the, only, okay. that, that's the part that Silver's scares me more a little bit. more standard. I would think so, but the, the gold to me seems okay. like it changes, and that's just that's just my opinion. Okay, um, we're I I'm actually red and gold. I, I'm good with red and gold. Um, you know, red, white, and blue is fine with me, but one A, one B to me, red and gold is is actually a color that you know I'm fine with that color. But I do agree the coaches and administration, and athletic are going to have to. You know, have a fun time picking out a gold that doesn't come across as yellow. And there's, yeah. I think there's several pro sports teams and college teams that we can look at, you know, kind of narrow in exactly what kind of defining color. One of that Nike, we... silver, whatever, gray. Okay, so, so if my notes are right, which they probably aren't, uh, but my notes are right, uh, red and gold has three favored. Well, I'm sorry, three, two one favored, two secondaries. We have two silver, red and silver, primary, and a red, white, and blue, two primary. Well, I just may have confused that even worse, huh? So, at this point, somebody want to make a motion to see? I, I mean, I move my, that we uh, that we go with a red and a shiny gold, or I don't know how you quantify the gold. I don't. Particularly like red and yellow. But. 
<laughs> Are you sure you want to do red? gold instead of silver? Okay. So I have a motion for red and gold. Those are our colors for Mr. Count. Is there a second? I have a wait. The, I have a quick. Uh, well, we have to. I, I have a motion on the table. So before we discuss, we've got to okay. get a second for that. Is there a second for that motion or not? It may die for lack of a second. Uh, second. Okay. So we have a motion for Mr. Count, second, Ms. Lee. Now discussion. Okay. Just want to do parliamentary, though, right? Um, it, those that wanted red, white, and blue. Because that was two of you, right? You two? Leo and Jeff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you already said you could do yeah, gold. Red and gold, I was fine with too. And what was, do you have a secondary? Or I would you rather do the silver if we're going to okay. pick another color. Just because there's so many variations of gold, it's going to get changed a hundred times over from pictures in the stands to everything under the sun. So you like black and silver, but silver is the secondary color. I, for I agree with the gold mm -hmm. issue because you've got like a San Francisco gold, you know, they're the real shiny helmet gold. And then you've got other variations, you know, I think you need to define it more clearly. You know, like Boston College has a very distinct gold helmet. Mm -hmm. You know, there you need to define where you're heading with on gold. Uh, is silver more standardized from a color for you guys who are playing in colors, paints, and flooring and stuff than gold is? I, I think I it don't. is, but it, yeah, I think it is. It's silver, silver. Silver, silver. Okay, for y'all, that, that's probably an open to discussion. We have architects here. I don't know if I want to get complicated enough to ask them, but at this point, <laughs> at this point, I have we have a motion in a second for red and gold. If that passes, that's what it is. If it doesn't pass, then we can try the next alternative. Uh, anybody? Y'all, any more comments? You're on a vote on that. On a vote on the red and gold. All right, all those in favor of red and gold have three. All opposed, three. So that motion does not carry. Now I'll entertain a red and silver motion. Wait. That was the next option. Oh, wait, you want another alternative? No, I'm saying, okay, so we can just change now? We Absolutely. Can, okay. We're going to vote until we clean slate. You get to vote again. No, you, you, yeah, you can vote on every everyone independently. So is there a motion for red and silver? Sure. Leland, do you want, or Mike, you want to make that motion? I'll make a motion red for red and silver. and silver. Is there a second? I'll second that. You have a second. Is there any other conversation? Okay, we're going to see if we get to four on this one. All in favor of the red and silver? One, two, three, four, five. All opposed? Hey. Mr. Taggart. <laughs> we, we have belt, Lake Belts in high school. I'll write this down. Broncos, red and silver. Go Broncos. Ladies and gentlemen, Woo! we have this complete. <laughs> um, and now, uh, Dr. King Cannon and principals, your job is to work with our students to implement this and make this work and, and, and do great things. Um, and, and again, I, we said this before, this is a choice. We've made a choice. And now our job is to support our kids. And that's what we're going to all be about. And I'm excited about cheering for our Broncos. Mm -hmm. And so we are going to support our kids regardless of what our preferences were. That is our decision, and that's where we are. Thank you all for your participation in this process. And uh, can't wait to read the social media comments that will be coming over the next hey, few days. Huh? Hey, let me just I'm going to close my account for at least a month. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and you know, there's so many things that we can do with this Bronco theme, with this yep. Western theme, like the the band, you know, the stampede and the high steppers for the drill, the dance team. I mean, they're just, and not that those have to be it. I'm just saying there are so many wonderful things we can do with our own culture here as a, you know, old West town. We can do this. We absolutely have great opportunity to celebrate. And, and one of the things we do well in Belton is celebrate our kids. And so I'm, I'm excited about what will come with this. I think that's a, it's going to be a great opportunity for new, new things to come about. And, and I will say, we all have to be really committed to reminding everybody that wasn't our mascot before. It right. was a name yes. of the yearbook, please perhaps, but it was that. not please our mascot. And I did a great <laughs> job of explaining that, but we need to make sure, because I keep hearing that coming up, yeah. uh, that myth. So we'll uh, we'll keep working on that, and Ty, Ty's done a good job of leading that. But, nope. uh, but it is now yep. our new mascot, so go Broncos. All right, next item on the agenda. Thank you all for tolerating our uh, discussions through this and, and watching in and... Um, Whatever you're tweeting and Facebooking, and <laughs> I can't wait to read uh, later. Um, 
<laughs> oh, I'm quite sure it's all over social media uh, at this point. I see enough of you with devices in your hands. <laughs> It's a great world we live in. Okay, well, this is a great time to move into a bond program updates. So it says Jared, but Jared is vacationing. Amy, you gonna get us going on this one? <laughs> All right. That wasn't as painful as it seemed like it was gonna be, right? I feel, feel bad that Sue wasn't able to be part of that. But. Welcome. Thank you. We're super excited. About... I don't know if you're gonna have to change your color. No. Nope. <laughs> We're not, we're not bringing anything forth on Lake Belton High School tonight. So, but we are making progress on that project. It's moving forward. Um, nor are we here to provide a big update on Elementary 11. I think you're going to do that, though, right. Casey, I'm, real I'm, quick. We're just talking about the auditorium in Lakewood tonight. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Casey and Jaina. Jared is out of town on his way back today, so we're thankful he's coming <laughs> back and safe and sound. And uh, you will see him next month, I'm sure. How long did that take? So, here we go. Uh, I think you all recognize me at this point. I'm Casey Nicholson. I've been assisting on all the Belton projects, but uh, tonight we're going to focus on. Sorry. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Tonight we're going to focus on the auditorium renovations and the Lakewood um, Elementary School edition, both of which we highlighted in scope last month. And as we're preparing our final documents here tonight, Jaina is going to touch on some of the interior details. And so uh, to just kick us off, last week we reviewed in detail all of these items that are included in the scope of the auditorium. Uh, everything from um, providing new plaza or accessible entry up at the front of the building, uh, redoing all the seats on the inside of the building or the house, um, updating all your, uh, your plumbing fixtures up in the lobby, refinishing a lot of your finishes across the board, interior finishes, and also uh, refinishing the stage flooring, adding new curtains, updating the lighting. So it's, it's much more of a modernization of the facility. That scope has not changed. We're just wrapping up the final documents on that. And Jane is going to give us a preview of sort of what's going on inside. This is a quick snapshot of that new lobby view at the Belton Wall Street Auditorium. So it's a nice facelift. You'll walk in, you see a nice feature wall with some digital screens and the casework down below so you can store things for events and whatnot if you wanted to set out cups and plates or flyers. That's a good space for that. Um, you see the new ceiling. We're going to clean that up, get a little bit of new lighting, and then a nice new flooring in that main lobby space. No popcorn ceiling. No more popcorn ceiling. <laughs> Uh, so we'll pass this around, and it's Here, labeled with the extent. Thank you. So sorry. <laughs> and going. I will. Yes, I will. I'll walk you guys through that. It'll be on the screen a little bit as well. So inside of the auditorium, the biggest change in here is all new seating. So it's really nice and comfortable seating. There's a sample of the fabric on there. It's a great durable fabric. It's going to be easy to keep clean and maintain. I believe the warranty is 10 years. Okay. So that's that's just the warranty. Right. It'll it'll outlive that for sure. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, but then inside of the auditorium house, a new fresh coat of paint, new curtains, a state. Casey mentioned, and then refinishing the wood floor. So we'll keep the wood floor in there, but just refinish it. It's got a lot of good life left in it. And then some more acoustic panels in that back wall. That's the image that we're seeing on the top right of this screen. That'll help with the acoustics a bit in the space. Um, so the chairs are red. I'm yeah, I was waiting to say that, Jamie. Yes. Red, but really, they're, they're red chairs. Correct. That's the fabric behind <laughs> it in the picture, okay, and then that is the fabric that you've got there. Yes, oh. sir. That's correct. I, I know. <laughs> and then we're keeping carpet in the aisles and some hard flooring up at the front. And that is the, it's a nice facelift. I think you'll walk in, it'll feel fresh. It'll feel like it's been revitalized. So have, I know it's a tight fit in between the seats. Are we, are we making any room So right now we're right around 850 seats, which is down. From what it is right now, I believe there's a thousand seats in there right now. So there, there's, there's more room. The chair is a bit more. The chair is a little modern bit modern sized. <laughs> in, this, in the knee so spacing is increased. Consider, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. grown ups can fit. And without hitting your knees on. Correct. Yes. 
Yes, yeah. yes. The chairs today are bigger. I and there's more handicaps. We are on that cross section aisle. We're getting a new topping slab to flatten that out and then add in some accessible seating at all three locations there. It will still be the largest seating auditorium in our area. So for our district. Um, Great. Bigger than PAC. So you know, we're using that, but clearly I think everybody's priority will be to have a little bigger. <laughs> be able to get in there, yes. Agreed. I guess we moved on to the Lakewood, but I just wanted to architecturally, are there any other additional questions on the auditorium? I was going to flip back to this list here, the scope list, and in, in there we indicated uh, a key component of this renovation is ADA modernization, and that ties into the ADA seats. To um, accommodate ADA accessible seats, that's anyone in a wheelchair or anyone uh, who uses assisted devices to walk, uh, you have to provide vertical and horizontal dispersion. And so currently when you walk into the auditorium, I suspect many of you have been in there multiple times, you walk in and you have the two aisles that go down towards the stage. Uh, those two, uh, two aisles will remain, uh, but we're instituting a cross aisle. Uh, in, the, in the set here. We reviewed that last month, and so we'll be providing some ADA seat, seating on that cross aisle, as well as a media platform. So if you choose to do board meetings there, you will have a video platform with um, electronic control. Okay, well that, that actually leads me to the next question. Are there changes to the stage being made, proposed in this? Yes, as we mentioned last, week, last month, uh, we are adding a platform lift at the front. Okay. And so currently the stage has two stairs. If I'm sitting in the audience, there's two stairs flanking the stage. And then off to stage right, there's an additional stair that's sort of behind the scenes. Uh, what we're taking is the, sta the stair over on stage right uh, that's in view of the audience. We're gonna be taking out that stairwell and putting in a platform lift. And that's not an elevator, it's just a, horizontal platform that raises up. Uh, and that way, if you've got a, a presentation or an event that requires accessibility to the stage that's in full view of the audience, uh, that, that meets the code requirements. Are we are we just refinishing the stage? Are we, are we, are we doing anything backstage with the- We're refinishing curtain? the stage flooring, as we mentioned. Uh, we're taking down all the existing curtains. There's currently an operable curtain at the proscenium opening. That's the big the big rectangle that you see, uh, there's, the we will be replacing it in kind with a new uh, curtain at the proscenium opening, as well as fixed curtains at the sides and at the rear of the stage. In the stage right, which currently includes two individual restrooms, as well as a mechanical or electrical yeah. room, we will not be upgrading those. Right. Uh, they're not required by code requirements. Okay. So... Um... So my other question is um, acoustics. Are we doing anything with acoustics and and that all yes. that sound and all all that? System? Yes, we didn't. Uh, we've been working with our electrical engineers as well as our mechanical engineers and Jaina here uh, about interiors. And so we'll be um, adding additional acoustic panels on the perimeter of the walls. Right now, if you go in there, they're like two feet by two feet every ten feet or so. It's not. It's not, not helping you. <laughs> We're also working with technology to adequately er, appropriately space. Um, uh, projection screens for viewing, uh, both in terms of a in more intimate board meeting and a larger presentation, as well as placing the speakers appropriately to um, eliminate the reverb. We don't want the person sitting in the last row hearing it two seconds behind what is spoken. Right, so it's for you. Yes. So, and, and you've referred to that several times. We've talked about, sometimes when we're recognizing students or we have a crowd, this room is getting kind of tight. And we've yes. talked about multi-use of that facility, potentially our moving, if we can not mess up a good auditorium by our being there. That's that's, that's really correct. Priority for and us. so to enable that, we are not building a fixed exactly. podium as a, as this. You will we will have a raised section. It, it's it can be moved in you know monthly for the board meetings, but we're hesitant to build in something fixed that's going to prohibit the use as an event space. Exactly. I suspect that most of your board meetings would occur down on the floor level, so you're more engaged with the audience. Yeah, I don't think we want to be on a stage. But then <laughs> if you do have a big events or uh, recognition ceremony, you may choose to do the recognitions oh, up on the stage, okay, but that, yeah. that provides you an option uh, if you'd like that more visible. Okay, and lighting? Lighting is all being um, updated. Uh, we are replacing the fixtures in location. We are also providing basic stage lighting to match similar, but uh, 
I'm going to paraphrase here. I believe the current operational is an on-off switch behind <laughs> the curtain. <laughs> and uh, we are providing um, sort of six to seven preset options up at the stage that uh, anyone can go in. And I want all the house lights on, or I want this stage light on. But at the media platform in the center of the auditorium, there will be more um, detailed or more advanced controls for someone who's trying to control uh, a little more advanced uh, production. Well, I'm excited about this. This is something, and I hear, I keep hearing from people. Um, uh, Mike and I were over at U UMHB PAC, but I had several comments there of excited about what's happening to our our uh, auditorium over here and mm -hmm. another venue that's going to be op available to our community, certainly for our schools, but to our community. Um, so I'm, uh, there's a lot of interest in this. There building. definitely is, a and lot we of pride in this. We've gotten a lot of good feedback. I mean, we've reached out to quite a few people, and we've heard some some positive. You know, we understand it's the gem of the community. You know, everyone wants it, so everyone's been there. <laughs> uh, mechanical would be a mad if I didn't point out it's not going to be kept at a fifty-five degree temperature anymore. It's going to be a little more comfortable, temperature-wise. <laughs> some better control. I want to add that this is um, this is not a performing arts center. It is an update to the auditorium. Oh, so. There are some upgrades, such as the lighting, but this is not going to be the high school musical place right. um, for theater productions. It, this would be more for choir performances, elementary programs, community events um, that um, require an audience and a stage. And so just want to make sure the board right. understands that. It doesn't have dressing the, rooms. The, it's it's not going to be. But there's been a lot of events. Yeah. Those of you have, that have been here a long time, I mean, you've had a lot of events in this when you were kids, right? Um, I was in several events. <laughs> you were in, of course. And it, what I mean. and it did like have dressing rooms. They're just the size of a closet. So I'm yes. assuming those are still there. Yes, yeah, so they're cozy dressing rooms. still some closets. <laughs> okay. I just, my grandmother's house was right across the street where those duplexes are, and we used to come down here all the time to all type of events, but my favorite was yeah. always the Lions Club show. Yeah, you'd get the yeah. candy, and you'd have yeah. the number in the candy, and come up yeah. front and get your get your prize. I always wanted TV, but I never wanted TV, so <laughs> Great. Just, That's right. Back a lot of cool memories. This is really a neat project for the community. This I, is a I great really project. Like yeah. 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 Agree. Yeah. Agree. Agree. Yes, and as we mentioned last month, uh, a lot of the focus has been on the interiors. On the exteriors, you are going to have a nicer entrance or souped-up entrance, if you will. You're going to have your beef pavers out there uh, with room to expand that capacity, and you're going to have some signage down at the street level so those driving by who haven't been there yet now know where to find it. <laughs> okay. So. Good deal. The, Quick question: the The entry ceiling is just going to be scraped and cleaned, and it's not going to be raised or. Right. Same anything. at the at the lobby and in the house. We're just scraping it and cleaning it. We're not getting into the ceiling any more than we have to. We are repairing any bad patches. If you see any water stains, any of that, that's not going to be replaced. But we're not taking down the whole ceiling. And lighting. And the lighting, yes, ma'am. Yeah, new lighting. That's going to look different. Great. Are we all right if we move on to Lakewood? Yep. Okay. So to remind us here, the scope of this project um, is in addition to Lakewood Elementary School, their current gymnasium is in a pre-engineered metal building at the rear of the site, and their current music rooms are in portable classrooms also at the rear of the site. And uh, as we mentioned last month, uh, we'll be adding an addition on. You can see that red box in the image to the left. We're adding it on to the front of the school, uh, sort of near their, their playground and running track. So thus, we will not be needing to demolish any existing site uh, components in that area. I believe the district is going to uh, eliminate the existing portables, or unless they use them for storage. But the pre-engineered metal building at the rear of the site will continue to be accessible for the school to use. Uh, by moving this to the front of the site, we're able to connect into the building itself, and so students do not do no longer have to go outside to get to gym, nor do they have to go outside to get to music class. It's all connected. Uh, the gymnasium, uh, we're going to come back to a minute to talk about the size, but the two music classrooms uh, are matching our new prototype design, and have, we consulted with the athletics director or the PE director on the campus, as well as the music uh, representative and the school principal, as well as the project executive committee. So we've gotten a, a good round of feedback here. Um, the elevation is down on the bottom right. And again, this is just hitting on some items that we talked about last month when we reviewed scope. Uh, Design-wise, we're going to be matching the, the 
existing exterior. So on the top right, that's the image of an existing portion of the building, and to the bottom right is our exterior rendering. So our brick veneer, if anyone was curious, we have selected, we're using Acme Brick, which is a local supplier, uh, and we've matched the colors in case you were curious and wanted to Google. <laughs> They're Weatherwood Gray and Mushroom Brown. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> but those are the colors. We're matching the design intent there. It is at the front of the school. Uh, we're also going to be adding in those red scuppers, the belt and red. Uh, glazing is going to be just like our standard windows. So there's, you know, we're definitely tying into the original intent. The original building was built in, I want to say, 86. I'd have to look up in my notes. Mid-80s, the original building was built. We're tying into an addition that was put on in 2004. Uh, so that architectural exterior tent intent has been carried around the entire facility. But I do want to go back because I heard rumor there's some questions. Yeah, before you get off the exterior, yeah. and I appreciate you mentioning that, that school's been added on to several times. times and, but one of the things that's been effective is tying it in so it doesn't look like it's pieced together. It, it is seamless, and, in, and you have to be quite knowledgeable of construction where as you're the, walking through the, the building to see yeah. where that is. There's some interesting issues, so this is really important, but it fits. Um, the other thing I want to mention, and I think that little teeny bitty type down there on, on that corner has the name on it. Yes, I apologize. I, That's okay. I'm not very I'm, talented just, with this pointer here. It helps here. me make the point. If we're going to put the sign on it, which I really like, let's make it big enough to see. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we, many years ago, went about and said, let's make sure it says Belton ISD on all of our schools. Because... Yep. Uh, that school, for example, is within the city limits of Temple, and we wanted to make sure, since Belton is not in its name, Belton ISD. So if we're going to put the name, make we it need bigger, bigger letters, mm -hmm. and it needs to include Belton ISD, mm -hmm. is my sense. That's consistent with what we've said on our marquees and all. So, mm -hmm. um, so uh, I like the idea of putting it, because that's a school, one of our schools that doesn't have a name that, mm -hmm. on the sign. It's out at the front, but not on the actual building. I think that's a good idea. Okay, I'll make sure. I believe that's been the case. I don't know how how dated this rendering is, but I'll I'll follow okay. up just to make sure. Okay. Um, Belton ISD is listed on there as well. Okay. So you want to go back inside? Yes, I do want to go back inside. I've gotten a, I've gotten a few questions lately about the gymnasium side and size, and I wanted to uh, provide some information here. Right. Um, when we originally were charged with this project, we were directed to um, match Sparta Elementary, for those that are familiar with that campus. Uh, similarly, a couple years ago, they had an exterior gym, pre-engineered middle building, and their music rooms were elsewhere. Uh, inside their building, they had something called a multi-purpose room, which was sort of this rectangular, not even rectangular, square, large volume room. And what they did at that renovation is they repurposed that um, multi-purpose room into two music classrooms in an office and some storage. And then they added on a gymnasium uh, of about 4,000 square feet. And so we have a gymnasium here in our what we call base bid. This is what we were planning to go out with of 4,000 square feet. Now, 4,000 square feet is hard to conceptualize, but what Sparta has has included is a court that is 30 feet by 60 feet. And I'll come back to these numbers. I'm not meaning to confuse anybody by these. Uh, we are simultaneously working on Belton Elementary School 11, which is a brand new facility. And that is based on the prototype at Tarver, High Point, and Chisholm Trail. And in all of those gymnasiums, you're seeing a square footage closer to 5,000 square feet. And so Sparta, 4,000 square feet. Ele elementary prototypes, 5,000 square feet. Just for the gym part? Just for the gym counting part. the music rooms and... Not and counting the music okay. rooms, just looking at the gyms. And I'm saying about 5,000 because it varies between 4,700 and 5,000. So just round numbers are easier to remember. <laughs> and in those larger gyms in the prototype schools, you're getting a court size that's uh, about 10 feet longer. And... Um, so when we were originally charged with this project, we were told to match SPARTA. And in reviewing it with um, the leadership committee and different programs in there, um, you know, we noted there's different court sizes and there's different gym sizes. The problem with putting a larger court into a smaller volume is you don't have appropriate runoffs at the end of your court. Your students run right into the wall. It's not pretty for anybody, but <laughs> that's, that's really what's constricting us. And so as part of our design, we have put in the smaller gym size or the Sparta gym size in is the base bid with an alternate to expand the building by eight feet to accommodate a larger court size. Now, if we were to truly match the prototypes, we'd actually have to expand the building by 15 feet, 
why we're not proposing to do that is one, we have enough runoff with eight feet addition, and two, uh, parts of this building are not sprinklered. So that it would be excessively expensive to run the sprinkler lines through the 2004 addition down into this addition. And so we're trying to be good stewards of the finances. And if we expand the building by eight feet to the west side, it's about 500 square feet. Uh, that would get us the full court size. And I, and I appreciate that very much. The, the new school designs have a, I mean, they're right at the entry, and so they kind of have a curved and glass front and entry, and so they, by design, they need more space. So I wouldn't have assumed that this would be that big. Um, I mean, there's so it makes sense that it doesn't have to be the same dimensions because mm -hmm. those are designed with kind of an entry. They to, they are. You, you know, you're absolutely uh, correct. Which is different than mm -hmm. a, a, the, what this design is. Mm -hmm. I, I'm concerned. Well, I don't know what a regulation elementary school gym I, a court is, um, but I would hate to build a court that is smaller than what we have agreed. Absolutely, and build. so UIL actually sense. puts forth, UIL puts forth st standards based on, I have to look at this acronym, I wrote it down here, cheat sheet, NFHS. If I've got athletic directors in the room, they're probably nodding along here. That's the National Federation of right. for High School Sports, what have you. They regulate an optimum court size for, col for a high school, but there's no verbiage in there about elementary school. Okay. Now, there well, how are, did we get to our conclusion of how our elementary court, and I'm not talking about, again, uh, there's two different issues here. The square footage of the building is kind of built into the design of the building and where it is, mm -hmm. and all that. but the actual court length. Yes. Width, how did we come to that conclusion? I mean, there uh, must be some standard we said, oh, we need mm -hmm. a, I don't remember what the number, 60, 70 foot. Well, I'll, I'll, foot. Uh, I can give you the caveat. With a 60 foot court, which is what Sparta has, you can use it for elementary education. If you put a 74 foot court in there, you can open it up for evening events for other um, associations to use it. So think weekend basketball tournament. Right. That wants to do all all of the extra things that we do at, at our other schools. Mm, so some well, of them. You what is it? What do we have at our size. other? So what, how long, how long is the court at Lakewood in the metal building? 64. Do we know? Right, 64, sorry, I apologize, yes. So our base bid has 64 foot long court. Um, our alternate bid has a 74 foot long court, I apologize. 10 feet. 10 feet difference. Do we know what we're moving them from? Are we down, are we shrinking? No, size? I don't have a number on their existing court size. I didn't measure that. I know that Sparta and some of the other buildings have a 60 foot uh, court size. So you're, you're the ones that you, you have currently and that you're renovating, or you have renovated thus far, are sticking to a 60-foot court. I've expanded it to 64 for this edition. I'm not aware. Uh, you said other ones. I'm only aware of Sparta, and that was like 10 years ago. So 10 okay. Years ago, so I wasn't sure if there were. I, I was under the impression that other campuses had renovations. I <laughs> might have misspoken there. I apologize. I've got a quick question. So can we do the expansion that you're talking about to get it and stay within yes, we. Uh, well, we as we are doing a CSP, which is con 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 competitive. Com seal thank proposal. you. I was struggling on the competitive. I was going to say consecutive, and I knew that wasn't right. Competitive sealed proposal. So we do not have a contractor on board right now to um, uh, to provide that estimate. Now, when we were doing the bond planning, we did look at recent uh, construction, commercial construction. It's different than residential or what you can do by yourself, you know, designing things. When we were doing budgeting for uh, the district, we... Yes, we have it in as... Sorry, I didn't know that so, was a question. So yeah. it's currently designed either way. The base, the base design is at the budgeted amount that we believe is going to fit 64 feet. But we've also got an alternate design in there to be bid to find out if we can afford the extra ten, the extra ten feet. Yes, so that's kind of how you do the I alternate. I think if you ask the people on board there in Lakewood, they would always opt for having more room. Of we, course, we, we everyone everywhere. Out, you know, yes. <laughs> so. I mean, uh, yeah. I guess the idea is if I mean raises the issue. As part is too small we, to do the kind of the things you mentioned before, I'd hate to build another one like that. That's yeah. Well, but is 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 Sparta? Do let's do it right. But you know, obviously, the question is, can we afford it? But let's not build it and then say, "Oops, let's add on." I mean, that's horribly expensive. Or well, what, are we, what are we not able to do as Sparta? 
Are we missing anything in Florida right now? I'm not aware that we are. Ability to use it for, I, I don't, I don't it's, really think that's a question. Good question. I would say it's just probably not a regulation basketball court, and I would look to the experts to say that. So um, you wouldn't have, I, you wouldn't have a competitive event there, but for elementary PE. It's adequate for elementary yeah, PE. Um. Right. And we would certainly defer to your athletic team to talk about the competitive use of different facilities, but you will have rec facility, you know, rec teams use a smaller gym. They're not Active doing UIL gyms. competition or that sort of thing. It's just not, the older the kids get, the less ideal it gets. Yeah, so so you're pro what you're proposing is to do a base and an alternate yeah. base which matches the 64 foot. Yeah. The alternate would get the extra 10 feet. That's correct. And then we'll know what the price is going to be. That's correct. And, and so when when this goes out to bid, the the contractors will be we'll bidding both. both prices, and then we can make an inform, informed decision based on the estimates on what we would well, like to pursue. Okay. So I would sure hope we'll come in with being able to do the alternate. Uh, but before we get off of that, I want to mention one of the things that's significant about this design that, that I don't think I heard you mention tonight that we talked about before is we're adding bathrooms. And that's a huge, huge issue at an elementary school, <laughs> adding bathrooms. That so is correct. Huge. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, we're adding them in an ideal area. Yep. Right now, students playing on recess, which is south of the red addition shown on that plan, are traipsing through that corridor that has academic classrooms to use the bathrooms towards the center of the school. This gets the restrooms directly accessible from the exterior, the playground area, and also allows your 70 student gym classes to have quick access to group restrooms and music classrooms before and after class. And again, as we've said, there's never enough bathrooms in an elementary school. There's never enough. That's, that's a, a really significant part of this mm -hmm. uh, plan and this proposal. Um, so if we're understanding the base bid and alternate, we're we're going to proceed, if you take no exceptions to that, we're going to proceed forward with issuing the documents in that way. I'm comfortable with that, uh, going, proceeding that direction, understanding that. And when I come back to next steps, I'll talk about in December, you're going to be helping make that decision, or you're not helping, you're making the decision <laughs> on if we're going to accept that or or not. Yes. <laughs> so if we're going to let, we're going to have Gina talk about the interiors for a minute, and then I'll recap sort of the general projects. Colors. Colors. <laughs> Uh, so speaking of the restrooms, this is a lovely rendering of the restroom corridor. So this is the corridor right outside of the gymnasium. The gymnasium is behind our back in this view. And then there's a little bench area, access area. The music rooms are to the right. And the red stripe that you see is consistent throughout the whole campus. The new, the 2004 edition, the original campus, and now this edition. So we're keeping that red stripe so the students can march along and stay in line. And then adding a few more colors in this space since it is a fun space. It's a music space and a gymnasium. And it is the recess restroom location. Um, and similarly, the finishes for those. We have matched the finishes at the existing campus with one exception being the restroom floors. Uh, with all of the other projects we have worked on, we are going with a grout-free. It's an epoxy floor, so it's a bit more durable. You have no grout to maintain, so we've kind of made that decision. Other than that, all of the other finishes, they are matching consistent in type and maintenance with the existing facility. So you can keep on waxing the floors the same as you have everywhere else. And I'll pass this around. does lead to a question of the, in the gymnasium, there's always a logo on the walls. And so we have generically put Go Belton, knowing that that will be a decision later on of whether or not. Yes. 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 Duty and crew, I bet, can figure out what they want on their walls. <laughs> well, like the point was, we were not really planning to put Go Belton. <laughs> I shouldn't say this out loud, but a personal preference, don't like yellow around bathrooms. <laughs> Fair enough. That's, that's personal preference. Never have understood that one. It's elementary school color. Primary, Primary colors. colors. 
All right. What else? Yeah. I'm just going to quickly wrap up here. Uh, next, this month, we uh, we are all. Uh, once we finalize these documents this month, we'll be issuing uh, the auditorium renovations, the Lakewood Elementary School addition, and the Elementary School 11. All three of those projects are complete in design and will be issued this month. And those will go out for bid. Uh, we will be receiving those bids in November and coming back to you in December to select your contractors. Um, next month, uh, part of our team will be back here, uh, Rebecca, Richter will be speaking at, at the high school project. Uh, we just wanted to let you know that we've, um, in the next few weeks, we're wrapping up the final user group meetings. That, that's a uh, meeting with each of the individual user groups to make sure we're capturing everything in design. And at your next board meeting, she'll be presenting the design development for approval. In January, we'll be reviewing the interior finishes, and the team will also be talking about the exterior finishes. Now that we have the school name, that should be simpler. In colors. In colors. <laughs> yes. Like Belden Broncos. And just looking forward past that, uh, the in mid-December, the high school will be hitting the 50% contract document stage, so things will be pretty ironed out. And that design phase, will be the design will be wrapping up in mid-March. So we're on schedule. I'm just reiterating those are the current dates. And then in December, as I mentioned a few times, we'll be back to talk about the three projects that are going out for bid this week. We'll be coming back to select contract contractors in December. And all of those projects will be ready to hit the ground running in early 2018. And since you mentioned um, user groups and all, I, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, Judy Schiller, but um, you've had a lot of input and a lot of opportunity for you and your staff to have input onto the, the design and function of, of how all that space is. Yes, colors and everything, I hope. What? And colors and everything. You've had input on all that, you and your crew? Okay, feel free to give it whatever input you feel I need to <laughs> before we get to the finished product. That's, that's one of the things we want. I did want to follow up last month, and I, I, um, I think, I can't remember, was it Leo brought up the canopy? Uh, uh, canopy's wrong. Covered walkway? Covered walkway. Yeah. Yes, and we, we put that into the project. Minutes. We put that into a project, uh, both a canopy for the bus queuing, and yep. we, uh, I don't know if we mentioned it last time, we also have canopies above each doorway. That's, you know, to provide a little bit of protection as someone is entering or exiting the door. That was a really good suggestion and made sense. I went out there and was out there the other day and I was looking at it and think, oh, that, that made sense. Mm -hmm. It looked right. So, yeah. but you well, got yeah, we, that we, in. We've added it how many, um, to how many exactly. schools? Exactly. Why, let's not mm -hmm. add it. Let's do it right. Mm -hmm. So, good, good. Great. Okay, anybody else have any questions for? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Tell Jared to be done with his vacations. Come on. Time have to work. Time. Yes. Make him work. <laughs> <laughs> He's checked social media already. He knows. All right, Dr. Muller, you're going to talk to us about approving the schematic design and design development was presented for the Wall Street Auditorium updates and Lakewood Elementary Music Classrooms and Gymnasium Edition projects. I certainly can. <laughs> That's what we got to do, right? Yes. We're asking you to approve both the schematic design and the design development uh, for the Wall Street Auditorium and the <coughs> Lakewood Elementary Music and Classrooms and Gym Edition Project. Um, if you approve these as presented, and you just heard the presentation, if you approve these as presented, then we will proceed quickly to the competitive seal proposals and bring that uh, back to you on the timeline that was just mentioned. Okay, You've, we've got the update. You've heard the need. Is there a motion to approve? I have a motion for Mr. Staggart, second for Mr. Camden. Any other comments, questions? All in favor of the motion, raise a hand. Pass it unanimously. Thank you very much for working with us. Thank you very much for your work. Thank you all for your input and participation in that process. All right, so we've kind of, it's been a good night for advanced academics, hasn't it? And, it's and been a great lots night. Lots of exciting <laughs> things. We started off celebrating uh, Serena and, and our other students' uh, accomplishments. Uh, so give us a, another up, some more update on GT and advanced academics. I will. So um, I am very excited tonight to talk about um, advanced academics because this is we offer a premier program in this area and for our students. And this is at the heart of what we do um, is to teach kids and to provide these learning opportunities. And I do want to take just a second. I know that we saw Christina Flores 
This is her first year to join us in Belton as our coordinator of advanced academics, and she's done an outstanding job. She's doing an outstanding job, and it's just going to continue to take us to the next level. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is our gifted and talented education program. We are required to provide an annual report, so the first part of this is going to be that annual evaluation. And that annual evaluation is based heavily on um, a self um, evaluation done by each of our campuses, which then results in the district rating. And that self-evaluation is actually developed by the state. We use the plan that they have out to carry out for the GT state plan. Each of our campuses evaluate themselves. They turn that in. And upon receiving that, we give ourselves a rating. At the district level, we are rated exemplary. And then that's based um, on the student assessment, the way we design our um, program, our curriculum instruction, the professional development we provide, our family involvement, and then we total those ratings up. And then overall, we had nine of our campuses that are exemplary, four that rec were recognized, and one that rated themselves as acceptable. We'll continue to work with our campuses to develop that plan. When you look at our GT population, we do look at the number of students we serve, and we look over a three-year peri uh, three period. This slide shows compares our GT identification by district subgroups, and you'll see where um, each um, criteria of GT students is compared to the district overall percentage of students in that area. Um, you'll note that we do have some areas we want to continue to work on, specifically among our Hispanic students and are economically disadvantaged. One thing we've done over the last two years is to test all of our students in second grade at Southwest and Miller Heights. And through that um, opportunity, we have identified students that um, might have been missed in our GT um, evaluation process. It's uh, one that's done based on teacher input or parent, but sometimes um, if somebody misses something, we don't want to take a chance with that. So we have done that, and we'll talk a little bit more about some um, what we're looking at in the future with that. We serve 942 students, which is right at 8.2% of the district. The state recommends around 5% is the average, and so we're a little bit above that. Um, and we're, we're proud um, to serve all of our students K-12. We looked at how we serve our students in K through um, fifth grade. It's primarily in a pullout services through our GT. At middle school, we have our pre-advanced classes, and then we'll talk about our AP and dual classes at high school. Um, our placement is another area that we continue to look at in our assessment of our students. And so right now we have about a 38% assessment rate, which means that we had last year 330 students that were identified. And then once we went through the testing criteria, we had 123 that were placed. So we continue to look at, um, at that and what we need to do to, to, to tighten that. Deanna, yes, is there any way that I could get this this slide here broken down by demographic and subgroups? Just mm -hmm. something I request for myself. Okay. Uh, but provide it for all of us. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. And then um, we want to talk about our advanced academic opportunities that we have because when you really think about some, um, we wanted to highlight our secondary programs and what we do for our students there. So in looking at our, sorry, our advanced placement courses, we have 24 advanced placement courses. We offer every ELA math, science, and social studies course offered through the um, college board. We work directly with the college board. Our teachers submit their syllabuses to college board for approval, and then um, students sign up to take the course. And we have, when you tally up all of the students, that's about... Um, 1,858 credits that will be earned through our AP courses. We do not um, put a placement on how many courses a student can take. We encourage students and their, to work with their parents to determine what's best for them and their needs. And then you can see on our AP exams for the last year, we, had, we administered 660 exams. That represents 327 students. 
and we had 189 of those students that scored a three or higher. That percentage is higher than the state, and we continue to work with our teachers to encourage students to take the assessment. So right now, students are um, able to take the assessment if they choose to take it or not, and so we are gonna continue to work with teachers to make sure everyone understands the importance of those assessments and encouraging students to take them. In addition to our AP courses, We've talked a lot about our dual, our um, well, our pre-AP courses, and what these are are these are the courses starting in sixth grade that prepare students for AP rigor, and so they too, we too work um, with the College Board standards. So when we develop curriculum for these courses, in addition to putting in and aligning courses to the state curriculum, we also align them to College Board standards. We have um, a little over eight thousand student seats for when you total all of these courses up and there's 22. So we have courses at all three middle school grades and in, in the core areas and then we have several high school courses before an AP course is in play. For instance, there's an AP English 3 course, so we have a pre-AP for English 1 and English 2. And those prepare students for that AP advanced rigor. We also have our dual credit courses um, I see that <laughs> Dr. Spencer is, is here for this tonight, and we really appreciated um, the opportunity to recognize them as a community partner. They have committed to meeting with us monthly to just um, continue to ensure a strong communication between Temple College and Belton ISD in terms of student enrollment, student course offerings, making sure our facilities are aligned to meet the needs um, of our students. We partner with UMHB, and then this year we offered um, online courses through UTPB. We have 632 three-hour credits obtainable through these courses, and there's 25 of those courses. So quite um, a large number of opportunities for our students in um, various levels. One of the areas that we have encouraged is um, courses in dual credit outside of our traditional core courses. And so you can see um, since last we presented, we've really expanded with our EMT offerings um, and our um, psychology, sociology, and just trying to add some dual credit courses in our CT, aligned with our CTE. We've done the same with our AP. I didn't highlight earlier, but um, our AP computer science and engineering were new strands. And then at the heart of all of this are our students. These are our top 10 students from last year. And we really look at opportunities in addition to offering courses for our students, we, and we want to um, recognize them for their achievements. Last year, we recognized 148 middle school students for the TIP, and those students are recognized in the seventh grade. They are given an opportunity to take the SAT just as if they were a, a junior or a senior. They take it at a testing site. Many of them attend Belton High School and sit by our juniors and seniors to take that test. Um, this is last year's numbers. Uh, but one thing I would highlight in this program is um, Christina did an excellent job at the ceremony of really talking with parents about the importance of what this recognition is and how it leads to a potential National Merit Scholar and the importance of PSAT and SAT at seventh grade. And then one thing we're extremely proud of are our AP scholars. We had 99 AP scholars. And that, that is a, a large achievement for our district. We're proud of the, um, those students. What's important to note in that number is that we had 29 students with a distinction. That means that 29 of our students took, three, um, took five or more exams, AP exams, and scored a 3.5 on them. And that's pretty impressive. Um, and there are three on all of them and a three or higher on five. And then we had eight students who are national AP scholars and they, they um, took eight assessments and scored a four or higher on those exams. And that is not an easy feat. So we're proud of those students. And then you can see our hist history of that. So um, just in, we've made quite growth and we've kind of stabilized since the 
13, 14 year with right at around 100 AP scholars. And we're continuing to work with our students to um, encourage them to take more assessments that we feel like they'll do well on. And then Dr. Kincannon mentioned earlier um, this program, our superintendent scholars program. This past year, we had 32 superintendent scholars. These students are identified in their 10th grade year in the top 85th percentile on the PSAT. And these students are um, what we'd like to say is on a path towards national merit semifinalist or finalist and um, working towards achieving a top score. Again, um, Christina has done an excellent job starting to expand the services that we offer these students. Um, and as a um, result of that, we've offered individualized tutoring, study sessions, Khan Academy, just really trying to push them to do their best on a test they took last week. So we'll be anxious to see what those results are. And then we recognize tonight our um, five amazing scholars, four that were commended. And, and this is, um, there are 1.6 million applicants who um, take the, the PSA team. Out of those, um, 50,000 are recognized as top scholars and 34,000 become commended. So 34,000 out of 1.6 million get to that level. And then and in terms of a national merit semifinalist, it's um, 16,000 out of the 1.6 million. So um, very, very small percentage and we are very proud of Serena. And then we also have, I um, want to recognize that our students take the SAT and the ACT. And as you heard tonight, we're proud of Serena for a perfect score. Our average is 22.5, which we'd point out is both higher than the state and national averages. And then the SAT was new format for last year with um, a revised format of um, no essay. No longer would there be an essay. Reading and writing would be together. And then math there would be two separate math assessments, one that you can use a calculator and one that you cannot. And our students scored um, just a hair higher than the state average. That's something we're going to continue to work on is um, students being able to do well on the SAT. I will point out one thing um, that that's important to note in the variance of scores is the percentage of students that take the test. And we have about 60% of our students taking the SAT. That's a very large percentage um, compared to state and national averages. And then um, while we're very proud of our program, we're very proud of our students, there's always room for improvement in ways that we can do better. Um, with that, our top priority has been to expand our superintendent scholars program. We administer the PSAT in 8th, 9th, and 10th grade prior to the National Merit Scholars Test. So we would like to um, make sure that once we get those scores back in December, that we have a plan in place to work with our students in 9th and 10th grade to start them um, on tutoring before they take the test again. We want to, we plan to incorporate more SAT and ACT strategies in our curriculum. So making sure that our curriculum documents are really tied to those assessments. We'd like to explore um, expanding our GT testing to all our second graders. So I mentioned that we have been doing that at Southwest and at Miller Heights, but we um, have started looking at other districts that are um, that test all their students, and so we'd like to explore that. Um, we'd like to create a stronger social media presence. If you have not already liked um, the Facebook page for Advanced Academics, or follow our the Twitter account, those, those are great social media outlets that um, we're building, and we are using Belton ISD. ADV ACA, and that's kind of a standard advanced academics handle. We looked at other districts and borrowed it, only put our name in front. And then we'd like to just continue to increase our parent communication and support in the development of our program. And we're very proud, very proud of our advanced academics students here. Okay, thank you.
other information about the delegate assembly, or you want to give us an update I, on the convention? Sure. I, I don't have anything on the delegate assembly. I did not uh, attend that with Sue since she was going. I decided to hit a couple of other a couple of other sessions, um, but it sounds like what the what was discussed in there, there was a common theme in some of the other sessions I sat in in terms of elections and consequences um, at the Fast Grow Schools Coalition luncheon that Dr. King Cannon and, and Sue and I sat in on, um, I guess it was the Friday, mm -hmm. Friday at lunch. Uh, Ross Ramsey, who, let me get it right, who he's with, yeah, with Texas Tribune, thank you. Um, he spoke for quite a while, um, said several interesting things, but, you know, big focus for him was um, getting Texas educators to vote. All of us sitting in this room who are um, involved in education, making sure that we are educated on the election process and know when and how and are encouraged to uh, to take the time to vote for pro-public education candidates. That's one way to, uh, to make a change through the legislative process. Um, so he spoke quite a bit about that. He had a lot of numbers he was throwing out in terms of the impact that just getting educators out to vote can have. Um, and he focused especially on primary elections for, for obvious reasons. So um, anyway, that was an interesting lunch. And he spoke a long time. <laughs> Actually, I was very late getting to the next session. So, um, so I had that that I attended. Um, the first, I started with legislative. Oh, by the way, back on elections, it was discussed a little bit as well in the fast Growth Schools Coalition breakfast that Dr. King Ken and I went to Saturday morning, and then randomly in other other sessions I went to um, the CEO of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas spoke a little bit about that as well. But I'll get back to that. Uh, the first session I attended was legislative update, and you all had already gone through that, so I don't want to spend much time on it. One thing I found interesting was that. Um, House Bill 1645, I guess, um, allows for Special Olympics athletes to earn letters, which I was excited about. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so we could have some, uh, I would encourage us anyway to look at, at what we can do there for our Belt and Tigers and, and future Lake Belt and Broncos that participate in Special Olympics, giving them an opportunity to turn a letter. Good deal, Mike. Um, so that, that kind of hit home with me. Um, and then let me see what else. Oh, I went to a session on strategic planning um, that I thought was interesting. Um, Mansfield ISD changed what they do. They wanted everyone in their district to understand their strategic plan. And strategic plans can be a bit complicated. Um, so they simplified it. They, uh, their superintendent focused on the one thing book and what they could do to simplify their strategic plan. It's a one page strategic plan that's basic. Uh, they expect everyone in the school district to understand it. Um, and then they also, one thing I found interesting, and I'm not recommending anything, I'm just saying what I sat in on and heard, um, but they have, uh, that filters down to their campus plans as well making them a little bit more simplified, having every campus focus on one thing that particular year, and then the administrator of that campus presents what their one thing is and how they're gonna focus on it that year to the board, which I thought was, was interesting. Um, anyway, so uh, the other thing that I said, in, oh, there were a couple of speakers that one thing they mentioned, and, and we've talked about this time and again, and everyone in here agrees with it, the importance of um, early childhood education, um, pre-K education. Um, but what was interesting to me was the two speakers that spoke about it. One was the mayor of Dallas at the Fast Girls Schools Coalition breakfast on Saturday. Uh, and the other was the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas, and both of them reinforced how important that is, and one of them actually, I don't remember which one, maybe the mayor of Dallas touched on, in addition to the importance of education uh, from zero to five, uh, the importance of uh, preparing teachers that are, they're mm -hmm. teaching those students. 
Um, and I thought that that was interesting too. Uh, and then we had uh, a young man, well, I'll say young, I don't know how old he was, um, he looked young, that did the second general session on Saturday, Hill Harper, uh, who really woke up the audience. He was very interesting and, and engaging. Um, what I found interesting was, uh, you know, a lot of his, uh, his speech was basically about conquering fear, um, not backing away and, and pursuing what you know is right, um, among other things. But he basically started his speech with, uh, or his presentation, by complimenting everyone in the room. All of us were administrators or board members. Um, and he quickly um, changed gears. And at one point, he asked who in the room uh, was on Instagram. And he was making a point how important it is to, um, to be involved in what your students are involved in and what kids are involved in. Um, and he asked how many people in the room are on Instagram, and he kept saying there are 4,000 people in the room. I don't know if there were 4,000 or not, but there was, it was a big crowd, and he saw seven people raise their hands. So, um, and he called us arrogant, rightfully so, um, for that. But I jumped on Instagram real quick and noticed that, <laughs> which I'd, I was already on, um, but he encouraged everyone to, to get on Instagram if they weren't. But when I got on, while he was talking, I noticed Angela Tekel was on it, and my guest who was sitting next to me was on it. And I know Dr. King Cannon and Sue on Instagram, based on a conversation we had later in the day. So of the seven people that raised their hand, Five of them were from here, so <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Um, not that that, not that, that doesn't apply to us, but anyway, so I don't have a whole lot more. I'll send my notes um, from different sessions and, and handouts, um, but that's all I can remember. That's great. That was... Well, thank you for sharing that, and please get those to Connie. And Sue had also told me she would get her notes to Connie and... And, and then so we can distribute it out to those of us who weren't able to attend. So thank you for sure. going and, and y'all representing us. Do you want to share anything sure. from your experiences? Um, Mike did a really good job of a uh, comprehensive job. I'll just add a couple of sessions that I attended that um, I really enjoyed were on engineering. Um, one was Birdville ISD and they have, uh, they focused on a middle school that they have and they're implementing the pre-engineering program. So I'd like to know some more about that and um, really want to take a look at their course sequence booklet and see how they, uh, how they progress through the grades. Um, we're in our third year of engineering in Belton ISD, so next year we'll have a group of students who, who will have gone all the way through for four years, and that's something I'm really excited about. So I'm looking to figure out how to build from uh, what we've got. Um, the other engineering program was from the University of Texas called Engineer Your World, and they have a big grant through the National Science Foundation, um, and they have been building curriculum for an engineering program. I don't think they're as far along as we are um, with the schools that they're working with, but they, they do offer a dual credit program <laughs> through the UT campuses for students who are taking engineering and so I actually just got the follow-up email from the presenter tonight with her slides um, and I think with us being as close as the University of Texas as we are that we want to see what they have to offer and see if there's something there that we can use so engineering is a, a program that I'm passionate about so I attended two sessions on that um, and then I went uh, Sue and I went to uh, <laughs> a website accessibility session just to uh, learned a little bit there, and so that was very good. We've been um, working on website accessibility here in the district, and I know Robert Pryor's done a lot of work on that behind the scenes, but um, the session was very well done and gave me some insight into um, exactly what that means, and um, I learned I need to update my choice of font so that it's easier to read. I'm an old Times New Roman person, and that's not the most accessible font, apparently. So um, that was a pretty interesting session. And then aside from that, I enjoyed the Fast Growth Schools Coalition um, events and um, the general sessions as well. So. Great. I'm glad y'all were able to do that. Certainly it's uh, important for us to take advantage of opportunities to learn. So. 
appreciate uh, y'all sharing what you learned and bringing that back to us. Okay, uh, issues or concerns for future agenda or administrative reports. I, I meant to mention this earlier, but this is maybe more appropriate. We have another school to name. Uh, we, <laughs> we have an elementary school, and we kind of intentionally, we talked a little bit about that last month, but we kind of intentionally didn't want to add one more thing for us to talk about necessarily. But next month, we're going to have a workshop where we can talk about process. Uh, we hopefully won't go through the same lengthy, laborious process that we went through um, for the high school, but we do have a process we've used in the past and, and uh, asked Dr. King Cannon to prepare that kind of process, what we've used in the past, what, how we will have input in coming to a conclusion so that we can name and we'll have that on next month's agenda. Um, other issues, Ty, got anything? Will, Mike? No, sir. Janet? Jeff? No. All right, well, uh, we'll just tell you there are lots of things going on. Uh, our next meeting though, and I want, this is important, our next meeting, a regular meeting is November 13th. That's early because of the holiday week. Thanksgiving is rapidly approaching uh, with that. And so our next meeting is November 13th at five o'clock. So we'll see you there. We have on our agenda a closed session for personnel, but there is not a need, specific need for that unless somebody has a particular item they're aware of. So hearing none, it is 8.03, meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for your participation tonight.